Facebook Live? Okay, we're going live. Literally. literally. Just uh, one minute. 30 seconds. It's live. We haven't seen Reverend Barber, so we'll have to have uh, Mr. Wright give the invocation. No, he's here. He's here? He's here. Yeah. Okay, all right. I didn't see okay. you. We're live on Facebook. Okay. Then I want to welcome Miami-Dade County to the 2021 State of Black Miami. Uh, my name is Stephen Hunter Johnson. I am the chair of the Miami-Dade Black Affairs Advisory Board. I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator. This event is streaming live both on Miami-Dade County Zoom as well as on the Black Affairs Advisory Board's Facebook Live page. And this event will also be recorded. It's my pleasure to also acknowledge all of the members of the Black Affairs Advisory Board who've joined us today, uh, starting first with Mr. Pierre Rutledge. Good evening, everyone. Ms. Sandy Sears. Good evening. Uh, Ms. Danny McMillan. Good evening. Dr. Tissa McGee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Ronald Mumford. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be here. Pastor Johnny Barber. <laughs> Mr. Edward, e Edgar Wright is on next. Blessings. Uh, and I, I, I can't uh, fail to acknowledge Ms. Retha Boone Fai, who is the program officer for the Black Affairs Advisory Board and does all things that needs to be done for the community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, I was supposed to introduce you, Mr. Uh, Johnson. <laughs> I'd like to point out that uh, Mr. Johnson is a shareholder with the law firm of Light Durker Diaz and a graduate of historically Black Coppin State University and the University of Miami Law School. He presently serves as chairman of the Black Affairs Advisory Board, secretary of the Coppin State University Development Foundation, and is a board member of Miami-Dade Public, Public Schools Audit and Budget Advisory Committee, as well as the City of Miami Housing Commercial Loan Committee. And despite all of that, he has time for his lovely wife, Gabrielle, one son, Dion, and twin daughters, Harper and Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for spearheading this and making sure that we had this magnificent event. Thank you. I, I thank you for all that. And uh, I assure you that your check is in the mail for, for <laughs> wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, introduction. Um, moving right along, I, I'd like to say happy Black History Month 2021. The Miami Day. Black Affairs Advisory Board would like to welcome you to the 2021 State of Black Miami Forum. 2020 was a challenging year. Social unrest, political unrest, and economic unrest gripped America and Miami-Dade County in significant ways. At the core of these things were issues that have remained unresolved since America's founding, but also at the core of much of the unease particular to 2020 has been COVID-19. To paraphrase the saying, if COVID-19 was America's cold, then it was Black America's pneumonia. The disparities in its impact are known and documented. COVID-19 has touched our health, our economics, and even our education. As a result, tonight we will be hearing from experts across two panels to discuss the disparities and what resources are available, as well as to find out what more can be done at the county level to assist the Black community. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce Pastor Johnny Barber, Senior Pastor of Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church and a valued member of the Black Affairs Advisory Board to offer the invocation. Evening to everyone and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna ask if we would all bow now for a word of prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for blessing us with life, with health and strength. Thank you for blessing us to be able to come and to gather for the occasion upon which we've gathered here on tonight. We invoke your presence. 
We pray now that you would bless this session, bless every presenter, bless every moderator. And then it is our prayer um, that we've been edified and we've been made the better because of what shall be shared here the course of this evening. Remember Miami-Dade County and all of its officials, our mayor, our commissioners, all of our leaders, bless us that we may soar to even higher heights. We pray this in faith. We pray it believing and receiving, saying amen, amen, and amen. Amen. With that said, uh, it, it is our honor and our privilege to be joined not only by Miami-Dade County's uh, mayor, but also by uh, many of its commissioners. So I would like to introduce Mayor Daniela Levine-Cava to bring greetings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and to all the members of the Black Affairs Advisory Board and all the distinguished guests and to our pastor. Uh, it is truly an honor to be with you, which I think is our fifth annual um, event. Uh, and acknowledgments to Commissioner Jean Monestim, who initiated the first, as I understand it. Uh, and now here we are joined by so many elected officials, uh, my colleagues uh, as commissioners, I still think of you as my colleague, we sit on the dais together after all, uh, but it's really, it's wonderful to, to be with all of you. Um, look, we are in a state, what did you say uh, when, um, America got a cold and the black community got pneumonia. Uh, that is what we are dealing with this year. Every time uh, we have a recession, the black community fares the worst. Uh, every time we look at disparities of healthcare, housing, economy, we know that our black community is, is uh, not given the opportunities of others. And this is the year 2021 when the disparities were made apparent for all the world to see, all those who had their eyes closed before, now their eyes are open. And I am so very proud to serve as county mayor to work with all of you to get it right. Uh, my Office of Equity and Inclusion that I've been talking about for a while now is going to roll out uh, in just a few days. And we're very excited to partner with you to make sure there's economic uh, opportunity, that county government is fair and equitable for, for hiring, for advancement, for procurement, that our small business community gets the help that it needs to stay strong, that apprentice programs um, help our young people have a sense of a better future so that we can work also on issues of justice reform and making sure that people uh, have uh, chances to, to get access to the American dream, which unfortunately has uh, gone in the wrong direction, not the right direction. So we cannot allow this pandemic, this economic recession to set us backwards. We must, must work together to fight, to be sure that this is the year that we truly move forward uh, to, to close those gaps. We're going to be working diligently on the disparity study advancement and many of my colleagues here are quite aware. We're gonna be working on the health disparities aspects. Uh, and again, you know, and let me name them. So Commissioner Danielle Cohn Higgins, she's on to this disparity study and eager to support her. Uh, Commissioner Keone McGee is chairing our healthcare committee. And we're going to be working with him on equitable distribution of the COVID vaccine so that your zip code uh, does, or your access to a computer does not determine whether you can be restored to, to health and, and safety. Um, uh, we have uh, Commissioner Hardiman, who's working on the economic development front uh, with oversight for our largest economic engine, the airport and, and other opportunities. And our vice chairman Gilbert, who uh, he's our vice chairman. <laughs> and he's gonna make sure <laughs> that there will be equity in all things. So um, I think I named, is Commissioner Monestim I saw him earlier. I already gave him credit for the historical uh, opportunity and he's chairing the housing committee this year. So we're gonna work together to make sure that uh, home ownership is not out of reach and to make sure that we create the housing that people need uh, to, to survive and thrive 
uh, in this challenging environment. So we have so many challenges, but I feel very, very hopeful that out of this challenge will come new opportunities. And I'm eager to hear the ideas uh, from, from all of you. And I thank you for giving me the, the brief opportunity to say hello. And each of you uh, hopefully know that I am here to partner with you to get it done. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Mayor Levine Kava. And thank you for, for being open. For those who, who don't know, uh, you can correspond with, with our Madam Mayor on Twitter. I have often and she's responding. Um, yeah. We appreciate your openness and we do look forward to working with your Office of Equity and Inclusion and your office uh, in over the next four years. So we, we look forward to getting much done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now have the honor to introduce uh, the commissioner for District 1. Uh, and the first time I can publicly introduce him as vice chairman, Oliver Gilbert III. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, first, let me just say thank you, Mayor, for, the, for actually acknowledging all the commissioners. To my colleagues on the county commission, uh, Commissioner Cohen Higgins, Commissioner McGee, uh, Commissioner Monestine, the senior member of, of well, the Black Caucus on the County Commission. Um, and I, I don't know if Commissioner Hardman is on, but listen, I, I, I really appreciate the fact that we're all on here. It's interesting that when you said Black America, uh, America gets a, a cold, Black America gets the flu, no, Black America gets COVID-19. When, 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 yeah, that's what we have, we get the pandemic. And, and so it, it's interesting because we're dealing with pandemic, but we're dealing with all the other things that exacerbate uh, how the pandemic affects us. You know, inequities in economics, health disparities that have persisted literally for over a century. The things that we, we've been talking about and things that we've been working on have become so much more important now. And so it's not just the state of Black Miami, it's, 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 the, state, it's the state of Black people. It's, it's, that's the, it's the state of Black housing that, that Commissioner McGee is going to be, or it's the state of Black health that Commissioner McGee is going to be working on because he understands that you know, from our perspective, as, as a population, Black Americans have the highest blood pressure of any discrete population on the entire planet. So when we say we get, you know, COVID-19 and people with high blood pressure will, will be disproportionately affected, well, well, that's literally us. So to hear that we don't want to take the vaccine is particularly disturbing. It, it's the state of Black housing that Commissioner Monastine, because it's not, we'll be working on, it's not just, it's not just whether we have adequate affordable housing. It's whether we have adequate market rate housing. It's whether banks actually discriminate on the type of loan instruments they offer in, in black communities so that it brings down the property value. All those things are at play. And so I appreciate you all holding, hosting this again this year. I appreciate us adapting as the rest of the community is doing, adapting to the fact that while we can't be in the same place, while we can't touch and agree actually physically, we can touch and agree virtually. And we can make you know, clear our determination to not let this actually deter us. You know, I appreciate all my colleagues. I appreciate the, the mayor for being the first mayor, and I think in the county's history to speak so, so forcefully to the inequities that forced, that, that, that forced themselves upon Black Miamians. I, I can't remember any elected official who wasn't Black actually, actually saying that in, in, in the past. And so I appreciate her for that. But it's not just enough for us to all say it. We have to actually do something about it. And I think we will. I think we will because I know my colleagues on the county commission. I know all my colleagues on the county commission. And I know that, that they're from different places and different times and different ages and different genders, but ultimately they're good people. And they understand the need to provide equity for all residents of Miami-Dade County. I look forward to working with you all to do that. Thank you all very much for, for actually convening tonight. And uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, now we, we will transition to District 3 and welcome and, and thank Commissioner Keon Hardiman for joining us and, and welcome Commissioner Hardiman. First of all, good evening, everyone. I see you, Brother Wright. Uh, I, I'd first like to say thank you for continuing the legacy of this organization and ensuring that this discussion continues to happen. So I, I really wanna give my praise, and I might not name all of you, but 
the Black Affairs Advisory Board. I mean, Pastor Barber, the Sears, Mr. McMillan, uh, Brother Wright, Brother Johnson, um, Dr. Tissa McGee, Pierre Rutledge, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Rashid, uh, Ms. Rita Boone Fry. Um, thank you so very much. And you know, what's interesting about my entrance into this space is that I remember being a college student at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University and being honored by this board, the Black Advisory, um, Black Affairs Advisory Board as the, what they called the first youth pillar of the community. And at the time, you know, I didn't quite you know, understand where that was going to take me per se. But I remember being amongst people that were being very, that were respected within my community. I remember you know, the individuals who were being honored then and, um, and, and really have an opportunity to look up to say, and this is something that I want to aspire to. And so little did we know that that young person that you have been honored as a youth pillar will move on and, and, and serve as a Miami-Dade County Commissioner. And, and so I have a different- uh, David. I have a, a different viewpoint of- David, yeah. uh, come see what's wrong. I can't hear anyone. <laughs> we can hear you though, Ms. Dave. Yes, we can. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I have a different perspective on, on this organization and what it means uh, to our community. And, and, and that's particularly why when Brother Johnson first brought me back into the fold, um, I, I made sure that I... Oh, shit, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay, I'm back. I'm sorry, that was me. It's okay. But that's particularly why when uh, Brother Hunter Johnson brought me back into the fold, I made sure that we had some dollars that were allocated to us scholarships for the people that were you named to be your next youth pillars of the community. I think that's something that we should continue to do. Um, I, I would happily still uh, contribute in that way. And, and I mean, because this is all about really and truly delivering for our community and delivering for the people that reside, that work, and they call um, Miami-Dade County the place uh, that they want to call home eventually or a place that they want to continue to uh, vacation. We have to make this a place that we can all exist in, and, um, and, and, and I'm happy to play a part of that as a Miami-Dade County Commissioner. So thank you very much for being a part of, of my journey there. Uh, and, and, and thank you so much, Commissioner Hardiman. And what Commissioner Hardiman didn't mention is that he, when he came forward with additional scholarship funds for the Young Pillars, he did so in a way that surprised us, and he did so on the spot. Yes, so sir. we, yes, we appreciate that level of commitment to the community um and to the the community pillars in general moving forward we're going to go to our newest commissioner district eight commissioner danielle cohen higgins good evening it's such a pleasure to be here and and thank you so much for hosting this very important conversation uh, and, you know, I want to start by just kind of focusing on its title, the state of Black Miami. What is the state of Black Miami? And I want to thank my colleague, Commissioner Monestine, for, for creating this. And I want to thank my colleagues on the call, Commissioner Hardiman, Commissioner McGee, Commissioner Gilbert, who, you know, I know we are all aligned in our interest uh, on moving the ball on these very, very critical issues. And I, of course, want to thank our Madam Mayor uh, for our, her support uh, on these critical issues and for announcing that the Office of Equity and Inclusion is coming soon, because I think it's an important effort that means a lot to all of us. And so, you know, when I think of the state of Black Miami, I, I, think, I think that it's both positive and negative. I think about the fact that yesterday, I, along with my colleagues, announced that for the very first time in the county's history, we have five Black commissioners sitting on the dais that is historic, that is representative, and that is something that should be celebrated. And, I, and I'm thankful uh, that we coordinated and made that announcement during uh, Black History Month. Uh, I, I am thankful uh, that I am the first Black commissioner to represent the hardworking residents of District 8. So in that regard, as far as representation, which matters and matters greatly, the state of Black Miami is pretty good. Uh, but then when we turn to the, the global health crisis that we are all dealing with, that our families, that our small businesses are all dealing with, we're painting a very, very different picture, right? Our community represents almost 20% of the residents in Miami-Dade County, yet only 7% of us have received this vaccination. This disparity is critical, and I know the administration and my colleagues are working to close that gap and close it quickly. Moreover, 
the issues as it pertains to race are intersectional. They can never be looked at in isolation. So when, as a resident of South Dade and one of the key voices of the residents of South Dade, when we learn that we are not receiving transportation in the form of rail, that affects the black community. That is an intersectional issue that directly affects our ability, our mobility and our opportunity. So in that regard, it's not such a high scorecard as far as the state of black Miami. You know, so what are we gonna do about it? How are we as commissioners in the administration gonna work towards improving these issues? And you know, I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I passed the legislation recently as it pertains to our working class community to make sure that our next round of vaccinations are going to our teachers, our law enforcement, our transit operators, our home healthcare workers, because if there is a priority list in vaccinations, then hopefully more of our community will receive representation and will receive those vaccinations. You know, I often talk about Martin Luther King because he's important to me and I know he's important to many of us and he, he often referred to the fierce urgency of now. Now with five black commissioners sitting on the dais, with a mayor that is fiercely supportive of our issues, with the current political and racial climate that we are all living in, I feel the fierce urgency of now. I know my colleagues do. And now is the time to improve the lives of our Black community. And I look forward to doing that with my colleagues and with our Madam Mayor. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to having this very incredible conversation this evening. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, moving now to District 9, Commissioner Keone McGee. Thank you, Stephen. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. I know I'm really deep in the South. We touch the Redlands, we touch the Everglades, but I tell you what, we're, we're on the mainland down here. We're on the mainland. Uh, let me just say uh, to the Black Affairs Board, thank you very much. And to you, Mr. Chair, thank you so much uh, for always being a listening ear. And to Aretha and to everyone else, thank you all, because without, without your help, without your assistance, uh, without your guidance, uh, many of us wouldn't be sitting here uh, having this discussion with you. I still remember the time when I was a young prosecutor at the state's attorney's office. Uh, many of you would actually call and give me uh, wisdom uh, and, and, and show me how to uh, walk a tightrope and or understand the system better from the outside and the inside. So I'm very indebted to each and every last one of you for that. Uh, to our Madam Mayor, uh, thank you so much uh, for leading the charge and being on the front line and saying things that uh, as our chair has uh, already eloquently stated, uh, what other mayors not stated before. You actually put it on the record and, and for that we really are appreciative. And to my chair, uh, Chair Gilbert, and to my colleagues, uh, Commissioners Monestine, uh, Commissioner Hardiman, and, and Commissioner uh, Cohen Higgins, it's always an honor and a privilege to be in your presence. Uh, I often say that there hasn't been um, in, in my time um, since I uh, left um, um, Howard University, uh, this much African-American firepower in one particular area uh, occupying one particular space. Uh, but let me just get to the point. Um, Black America wants everything that every other person and every other um, micro-America uh, um, segment here in this country is entitled to, right? And that is faith, family, flag, and the future. Uh, those are the four pillars that we've all have come to realize that actually hold up this great country. And as many of us are aware and keenly aware, um, those pillars are what actually drive each and every last one of us uh, to make our way to county hall, uh, to the state legislature, to the federal level, um, and, and to get up in the mornings and work on behalf of our kids and our family and our community. Uh, each and every last one of us clearly understand that when one of those pillars are, uh, is missing, we find ourselves in, in, in a predicament that creates a disparity. And we're starting to see what happens when, when, when we're not having access to our, our faith, our family, our flag, and our future. We're starting to see what happens when the economics and transportations are not there uh, to give us a hand up. Um, we're starting to see what happens when uh, the reality of being Black in America um, is, 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 is put on front street so the entire world can see when um, there's a disparity as it relates to equity and, and housing, as it relates to transportation, and as it relates to just simply walking down the streets um, and having conversation and interactions with our neighbors. So this, this forum here gives us that platform to talk about that tough issue 
because again, and I'll and I'll and I'll and I make no small fuss about it. But again, right here at this particular moment, at this form, I do not believe we can assemble um, this type of intellectual firepower to deal with the issues that we're facing. I'll close by saying this: economics, transportation, um, those are going to have those are going to be the two factors that I believe. Um, are going to have to work hand to hand uh, to bring about the equity and equality that we so much deserve. It's not that we're asking for a handout. We're simply saying allow for us to have the same access to the same table that so many others have um, and have had for years. So when we hear about the state of Black, of Amer of Black America, we're simply saying, yes, we are here to stay. We are here to play, but we're simply Get, attempting to get you all to recognize that we want a fair shake similar to everyone else. So on behalf of District 9, a, a place that is uh, uh, located uh, right above the Florida Keys, um, and we have the Everglades to our west and the Biscayne Bay to our east and, and all of the rest of this good stuff in Miami-Dade to the north, I, I bring greetings and I say thank you all for having this great dialogue, this great conversation, but more than anything, uh, this great fellowship. Uh, I, I want to say thank you, Commissioner McGee. Uh, if everyone has been paying attention, you'll notice that we've moved from north to south, literally from county line to the Keys, but we skipped something. We skipped District 2, and we skipped District 2 for a reason, because it wouldn't be right to not allow the last word on this moment, on this day, is to District 2's commissioner, my commissioner, uh, Commissioner Jean Monestine, because the State of Black Miami was an initiative he began when he served as chair of the county commission. And he so graciously allowed the Black Affairs Advisory Board to pick it up and continue the legacy. So with that, Commissioner Monestine, we, we love to hear a word, sir. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, happy Black History Month to all. And uh, I wanna say thank you as well to the Miami-Dade County uh, Black Affairs Advisory Board for once again providing the forum to have an open dialogue about the challenges facing our ethnically and uh, very diverse Miami-Dade County. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, we've worked hard to help build equity, um, not just in my district, but throughout Black Miami-Dade County and, and also for other disenfranchised groups in our community. And in light of, our, of one of our greatest challenges, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I have strived through the introduction of legislation and the dissemination of information uh, to combat the inequality and the inequity uh, and resources clearly delineated uh, by the role that race and ethnicity play in our battle to overcome that virus, the corona pandemic. Uh, can't talk about coronavirus without being reminded about health disparity. Uh, health disparities, uh, health disparity is not a, a new topic for black people in the United States of America, for Black people in the state of Florida, for Black people in Miami-Dade County. For, and, and historically, vulnerable communities have long suffered the impact of health inequality. And that is the very case at this moment right now. Uh, these disparities that have previously been documented are currently being once more documented in an array of articles by the Centers for Disease Control and uh, and prevention, the National Institute of Health, and other social and economic think tanks. Uh, however, in spite of all adv advocacy and, and that of those who fought before us, we are yet to find partners and society and, and, and government who are fully, fully, I say, committed to investing equitably in our community. Uh, but uh, we, we are grateful that uh, many of us have invested greatly in the last uh, elections that took place locally uh, and nationally. And we, we like the sound that we're hearing right now. 
will like the verb that are being pronounced by our current elected officials, uh, both in Washington and at the county level. And I can say that we have reasons to be hopeful uh, for we can see light at the end of the tunnel if in fact our partners in government, both at the county and at this uh, uh, federal level, uh, and of course at the state level as well, continue to uh, uh, hold and keep their commitment. Low income black newly immigrated and disenfranchised populations have been shown to be the last to be tested and impacted the longest by communicable diseases. COVID have further prove, proven that that's the case. Uh, uh, our people, uh, at times they are afraid, at times they lack the access uh, to institutions and to organizations that offer health services. And that is, is historically the case. And, and there's no difference right now. That's exactly why uh, many of my colleagues and myself, we've been pushing strongly uh, for our government, especially at the county, uh, to aggressively uh, uh, communicate with our people, aggressively uh, uh, fine fine tune their messaging, uh, 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 you know, and and the right channels and medium to communicate with our people. And and we we can say at last we're seeing this happening over the last few weeks, and we're grateful. But we need to continue to be proactive if we're going to keep the state of Black Miami strong. And now we are faced with the questions, do these same equalities, inequalities that uh, abounded years ago, uh, 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 do these inequalities will continue to challenge the welfare of our, of our youth, of our posterity? And this is what we're fighting for because we don't want that to be uh, the case. And in regards to vaccination, we're praying that uh, uh, the most vulnerable uh, uh, are being considered when government make decisions and we are at the table for a reason to continue to, to uh, sound that alarm to make sure that our people are heard. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to unfold, we can expect the poorest among us to endure greater financial pains because for as, as long as we, we, we've lived, we know that education, social injustice, uh, education and justice and economic injustice have been the roadmap through which our community travel. But we understand that economic, social, and educational justice are also the roadmap Dana. that must be traveled if we are to heal our community and ensuring the prosperity of all the people we serve. There is no time like the present time to fight hard and to fight harder for our people. I look forward to a productive conversation well, you don't this want to evening. I look forward to uh, this board and all our partners to continue to work hard to um, uh, open doors for our people and help them see uh, better days ahead, especially that, that we've been able to put 2020 be behind us. Let us all hope that 2021 offer great educational social and economic justice for our people. And next year, we can gladly and proudly say that the state of Black Miami is quite much stronger. Thank you so very much for having me here tonight. Thank you so much, Commissioner Monestine. Uh, That's our commissioner. That's our commissioner. <laughs> now you see why I left him as the closer. That's, that's what that was. That was the closer. And I hope that, that Miami-Dade County and the world can appreciate the, the breadth of diversity that sits on the dais now, not only in the chair of the mayor, but across the entire dais. To, to have uh, five Black commissioners is a first. It's a first that this board acknowledges. It's something that carries with it. Uh, great acclaim and also great responsibility because I can tell you based on the, the comments we're getting on Facebook, the people are looking and watching and will hold us accountable for what we accomplish with this, this as large a majority as we've ever had. Um, I also though know that knowing the, the people on the dais that I think 
that the world's going to be shocked and surprised by much of the change that, that you all bring. And like I said, we look forward to helping and thank you all so much for participating. Also, one last thing, we intend to do um, the a cross-promoted uh, forum with the Hispanic Affairs Advisory Board because there have been some new, newly inflamed tensions and we really would like your participation there as well, because Miami is probably one of the most diverse places in the country. Um, but with that diversity, sometimes comes friction that a good dialogue will help address. So we thank you all so much for coming. We also thank you all so much for being timely because it is now 735 and we are ready for our very first panel. Uh, before I do that, though, there are some additional uh, board members who have uh, arrived. So I want to acknowledge Ms. Priscilla Dames, the immediate past chair of the Black Affairs Advisory Board. And Mr. Jihad Rashid. Oh, Ms. Dames. No, I was just going to say I am just so pleased at the way you wrapped that up, talking about the diversity on the commission. I am so ecstatic about the composition and our new mayor. And just thank you for acknowledging me. Thank you. And Mr. Jahid Rashid. Jahid Rashid, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. How are you? I uh, just want to take this brief opportunity to say I'm happy that uh, to be with this panel uh, and with our new commission. Now we can turn the obvious state of our affairs and aspirations into action steps. Yeah. And we've been redundant in saying what our conditions are, and we've been very redundant in saying what we want to do, but we have to task ourselves, and I'm gonna be a part of that. What are those things that we need to do to specifically address that problem? Because we now have the team that can deliver. So it's incumbent upon us, this panel, to come up with those initiatives and programs to make it happen. And thank you. And before I, I pass it to uh, uh, Cliff, Mr. Cliff Thomas, Mr. Brandon Bartley. I know Mr. Bartley's here, um, but I did want to acknowledge him as well. Uh, Ms. Boone, before I pass it to Mr. Cliff Thomas, who I would introduce, but we're passing the, the, the moderation duties off to him anyway, I, I think you had some announcements that you wanted to make? Not necessarily announcements. I wanted to thank a few people. I wanted to thank DeAndre Slater, uh, Rizal Marino, Anna Chalmers, uh, as well as the committee members and the Black Affairs Advisory Board for doing this. Um, I want everybody at this point to practice one second of mindfulness. Let's all just take a deep breath before we dive into this ex very, very deep issue that is impacting our community. So everybody take a deep breath. Let it go and let's dive in. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And before, wait, I also have Mr. Rodney Jacobs. Uh, uh, who also has joined us, if he, he would say hello. Appreciate your brother Johnson. As a resident millennial, obviously I'm a little bit late because I keep long hours. So um, you left me out, but I still love you though. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. You, you'll be heading up a panel in, in just a moment. Um, with that said, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Sears will be hosting our first panel. Um, Mr. Slater, please check your email uh, for one of the panelists on our second panel. And I will mute myself. Uh, Ms. Sears, Mr. Thomas, it's on you. Thank you so much. I'll introduce the next segment and I'll have my colleague, Mr. Thomas, introduce the panelists. So during this um, first segment of our conversation this evening, we will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on two populations two vulnerable populations, Blacks and also the homeless population. As has been said, Blacks have been disproportionately impacted by all COVID indicators, including number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Also, as has been said, 
COVID vaccines are readily available, potentially as a life-saving solution. Unfortunately, however, it has exposed the racial divide. Uh, someone did indicate that the last published re report shows that here in Mi Miami-Dade County, while Blacks make up about 16% of the population, vaccines have been administered to only 67% of Blacks for varying reasons. So this evening, we'd like to delve a bit further into topics including the impact of COVID-19 on Blacks, why it is important for Blacks to take the vaccine, how Blacks can overcome what we call vaccine hesitancy. We'd also like to take some time to examine how our public hospital, our safety net, the Jackson Health System is administering vaccines in ways that can in fact uh, close the racial gap. And then finally, we'd like to take some time talking about the impact of COVID-19 on our homeless population testing, uh, how that population has been impacted, and any plans for vaccination. But with that, I'd like to have our colleague, my colleague, Cliff Thomas, introduce our panelists to engage in this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Holder. Uh, our first panelist, Dr. Cheryl Holder, is the co-chair of Florida uh, Clinicians for Climate Action. Dr. Holder is also a board certified in internal medicine and has dedicated her medical career to serving under uh, underserved the population. As president of the Florida State Medical Association, which is also which is affiliated with the National Medical Association, Dr. Holder works with nine local Florida medical uh, societies to address health disparities and increase the visibility of African American physicians. Uh, since 2009, Dr. Holder has served as a fac faculty member at Florida International University, uh, at the Herbert Winther uh, College of Medicine, and has recently appointed internal uh, associate dean of diversity, equality, uh, inclusion, uh, inclusion uh, community uh, initiatives. And also her focus is on teaching medical students about working in underserved com communities and promoting diversity in health professions throughout uh, pipeline program. Our next <laughs> panelist is Matthew Pinzer. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, just good evening, that's it. Uh, Mark Pinzer is the Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Miami Jackson Health System, um, helping direct systems patient acquisition and loyalty strategy while overseeing the staff that manages uh, Jackson Public's face through media relations, marketing, advertising, and community outreach, branding, and digital media. Jackson is among the nation's largest and most uh, respected public hospital systems with more than 2,000 beds and global leadership in specialty care. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Carol Biggs. She serves as Chief Nursing Officer and Vice President of Nursing for Jackson Health System and is responsible for the leadership and direction of patient care from the neonatal to geriatric units. Uh, under her direction, uh, standards of patient care are followed in cost effective manage based on the mission and vision and values of the institution. Her responsibilities include uh, strategic planning, business, new product development, performance improvement, financial accountability, and personal management. Our next, uh, Dr. Biggs. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And our last panelist for the session will be Dr. Armin Henderson. He's from, he's from Philadelphia, a native and graduate of Mahari School of Medicine and Vanderbilt. Uh, he completed his residency and training in internal medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital and the University of Miami uh, 2017. And he stayed on as a, as a faculty and currently serving as assistant professor of medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Henderson. Thank you for having me. 
and that is my plan. Well, Mr. Mr. Thomas, don't forget Stanley Campbell, the CEO of MyVex. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Stanley Campbell is a scientist and business leader with a extensive experience in research and development and tradition of advanced technology into government and commercial operation. As founder of CEO of Eagle Force uh, Associates and Eagle Force Health, Mr. Campbell has uh, more than eight uh, patent uh, submissions in the business, intelligence, and security and healthcare arenas. Mr. Campbell. Thank you all and, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, Many of you might not uh, recognize me, but I'm from a five, fifth generation uh, uh, Miami, and um, and I'm uh, extremely glad to be here. And hopefully, we'll we'll be able to help get some things done uh, to the other uh, panelists uh, comment. Thank you, thank you to all our panelists. And Miss Sears, I'll turn it back over to you. Hey, Dr. Holder, we'll start with you. The impact of COVID-19 on Blacks and why we should take the vaccine. Well, we've seen the data. I think everyone's very much aware of what it is and how we've been significantly impacted twice to death. And when you think about what's happened, as everyone has said, it's like COVID-19 just magnified what's been happening in our communities for the last hundreds of years and rapidly accelerated death. But the morbidities, the difficulties that the black community has undergone over years that has led to diabetes, high blood pressure, um, worsening immune system, low vitamin D levels, has made that person more susceptible when an infection comes around. And then the, where we work, where we play, where we go to church, all those aspects then makes you even more vulnerable. So we know black community live in multi-generational homes. They live in smaller homes. They live in more people per home than any of the other communities, including probably equivalent to the Hispanic community. And they work in jobs that put them at the front in front of people who would most likely pass on infections. So it's nothing but our skin color because there's no race. We are all the same genetically. What we have are some minor differences, but what is really impactful is our social conditions. So black people have, have gotten more infections. Black people are more likely to perish from it because of so many factors that we all know. So why should we take the vaccine? I mean, it all makes, it's like, okay, you're dying, you're sicker. Why aren't you getting the vaccine? But we also, from hundreds of years of oppression, have become more hesitant and I understand. And I think as I tell my patients, everyone, yeah, you do have to look at the risk, the benefits and the alternatives. And if you've constantly endured more negative than you have positive from a health system, you are going to hold back and wait for some more information and reach out and maybe not jump at the first thing. And this may be a healthy response. So how do we as a society work towards that? And that's what we have to take the responsibility to say, how are we going to bridge this gap and understand and with compassion, see why people are making these decisions. And so, yeah, we will take the vaccine because I'm seeing it if it's available. Once you give that information from trusted messengers, from folks that they know really care for them and will have some health care and so many other things that we could do to make sure that the community knows, I got your back, I'm here for you, and we really want you to live. And when we do that, we will not have any hesitancy at the degree that we're having now. That's great, Dr. Holder. Um, Rita, as an aside, could you please tell our listening audience how they might ask questions? My understanding is that they can ask questions on Facebook, but because this is a county um, um, Zoom, that they can't actually come into a chat room. So if they go to Facebook, they can probably, and if not, Mr. Johnson's going to ask them to send it to my email address, 
which is retha.boom-fi at miamiday.gov. Thank you. Could you repeat your email address, please? It's retha, R-E-T-H-A dot B as in boy, O-O-N-E dash F-Y-E at miamiday.gov. If we can. Anyone who might have questions, thank you. Yeah. And Miss and Miss Sears, just so that you know, we are monitoring Facebook Live, and uh, we we do have some questions that are pending on Facebook Live now. Very good, excellent, and thank you, Dr. Holder. Dr. Biggs, might you want to add to that discussion? Impact, vaccine hesitancy, what you're seeing at Jackson. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. But before I do that, I do have to say, who say you can't go home again? Uh, I just want to let everybody know, years ago in the 80s, Dr. Holder and I worked together in the clinic and Sandy Sears was our, was our administrator. So, That's right. <laughs> uh, Good to see you again. <laughs> yes. That's great. Uh, you know, really, uh, when, 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 I, when I talk to people about um, taking the vaccine, you know, as Dr. Holder said, we, 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 have, to, we have to face the ele elephant in the room, right? We have to admit and address the way black people have been treated over the years, the, the disparities in, in healthcare. Still today, um, we have the highest mortality for um, maternal, um, for newborn uh, birth um, death rate, you know, so it's, it's, still, it's still a reality. So what, what my conversation is when I speak to, to my people is that we can't let the pastel uh, determine our future. We have to step in and take responsibility for it. And I think actually this vaccine is actually the first time when there's like true transparency with, uh, with the disparity in the sense that it is the same vaccine, you know, as I said to a group I was speaking to before, when we pull out a vial and pull the, the medicine out, you get you get five to six doses out of that vial. It's the next five to six people in line that gets it, whether black, white, Spanish, brown, you know. So there is no opportunity for anybody to do any monkey business uh, with this with this vaccine. So I wanna I wanna really make sure that we drive that point home to know that one we're all watching also right, and we took the vaccine. And we took it for many reasons. One, we want to live. We want to, you know, my mom always taught me an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So we, we uh, opportunity to prevent this uh, disease, this deadly, deadly disease. Um, let's take it and put ourselves for a chance. Let's black people, let's put ourselves in a position to win. Let's get to the front of the line this time and not be left, you know, left behind. So that's really, I really, want to get that message out so that everyone know it's safe, the efficacy is there, the, the science is there. We have now, we have now have millions of people who have taken the vaccine and the side effects are very minimal. And, you know, we can talk some more about um, that later, but the important part is the vaccine is there, it's safe, it's available to you. Don't, don't miss uh, the opportunity. Very good, thank you. Chairman Johnson, are we seeing any questions we might want to raise at this point for the, and discuss yeah, for the benefit well, of all of us? Well, I have, there are two things. One, I think Mr. Pinzer um, has a, a brief video presentation that he's set to show. It should only be about five minutes. Um, and I think that it's important for the community to, to view that. Um, but two, just so everybody knows, the, the, the questions we're getting are, what are we doing to establish COVID vaccine distribution locations within the Black community and what geographic locations are being considered? We're also, we're also getting, what, what are we doing to address the disparities in distribution? As everyone's aware, it appears that the city of Opalaka has a 2% uh, vaccination rate for its seniors. However, uh, it's also noted that Fisher Island has a 50% vaccination rate for seniors. And the third question, I think this is directly for uh, Mr. Pinzer, is there, there has been this uh, uh, campaign going on where Jackson will tweet out that it will be shortly opening up uh, distribution slots. 
and then tweeting that the slots are closed. I, most recently, I'll note that it was uh, after 9 p.m. Uh, or after 8 p.m. on Monday when that happened. And what are we doing to address this, to open up the list? And you know, we're, we're expecting a lot from our seniors to be on Twitter at, at 9 and 10 o'clock looking for these things. So those, those things I, I'm putting out there, but I know Mr. Pinzer has, has a video and, and I think it would be worthwhile. And did Absolutely. you want me to address that at all? I'm not sure. So I. Yes, so I, I Mayor, Mayor, we, <laughs> we, we are here and we're happy for your input. This is, this is live. Right, so. right. Well, first of all, let me say that we live in a world of a vaccine <laughs> shortage. And if I could just get vaccine, I would be very happy. I could sleep well at night because people are eager to get it. And that is the good news. Um, but for sure, you know, it's come in fits and starts. Uh, you know, it's up to the governor who gets it, where, when, and how. I do commend Jackson for really being proactive about uh, making sure that it was more equitable. And we have partnered with Jackson to make that. So uh, at the county, you know, our first allocation, you know, that was it. We didn't know we were getting any more. I had to lobby and push to get more. And now I'm in the regular distribution, uh, but um, the, the lion's share goes to the state sites. Now uh, we did add the phone call and we are this week adding the one-time registration. So people don't have to hunt all over, but the supply we get is small compared to the state sites at Marlins and Hard Rock and small compared to Jackson. So we're all working together. They're reporting uh, so we can coordinate across the board and um, we have to be diligent about identifying who isn't able to, you know, get online or make the call or even they're scared or they, you know, this church outreach has been very, very effective, very effective. And um, we, we uh, had a, a call today, a round table with 150 organizations. Some of you were on it to get ideas how to get to the hardest to reach. So um, we're going to keep that up. We have a plan that is, is rolling out you know, we're in a state of emergency and the county is responsible for managing emergencies, but the vaccine has not been rolling through the county. So we have done our best to uh, make sure we can get the information out to the public, but you know, so far the public still has to register three times uh, to, to be on a list. Uh, we've also heard that some hospitals are now going to be getting vaccine. They're the only ones under the governor's order that can vaccinate uh, people under 65 with special conditions. So as soon as we have all that information, we'll get it out as well. But the bottom line is we do not have the vaccine that we need for the population that has been prioritized even so far. So, you know, how are we gonna get to herd immunity if we can't up the, the supply and the vaccination? Thank you so much, Mayor, that's great information. And now, uh, Matthew Pinzer, if we could hear from you. Hey. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and Mr. Chairman and members of the board, it's a real honor for me to be here. Um, some old friends on this call and uh, some new friends too. Um, let me speak very briefly to a couple of those issues that the chairman brought up from the questions. And then I do wanna share this video. Um, when we got about two weeks into the public vaccination process, uh, one of the things that our CEO noticed working with our team was that in a community where about 16% of the population is black, um, only about eight or 9% of our vaccinations had gone to black patients. Uh, so one of the first things that we did was start partnering with the churches. Uh, other faith organizations too, but about 70, 75% of it was with black churches. Um, that was really successful. In fact, Pastor Barber, I know he's still here. We were able to do a little bit with Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist. We've actually partnered with more than 70 different churches, uh, mosques, synagogues, temples by now. Um, and we've done about um, 8,000 patients that way. Um, it was successful enough that last week we did a small pilot project working with some non-faith-based community organizations. Uh, and thanks to Sandy and some others, uh, that's rolling out in a much bigger way this week. So we're going beyond those faith-based organizations. We're working with the Black sororities through Links and through Alpha Kappa Alpha and through, Dia, uh, and through the Deltas. Um, we are working with the Black Nurses Association. We're working with the Haitian Neighborhood Center, St. La. We're working with the Center for Haitian Studies. Uh, and through all of these projects, our projection is that by the end of the day on Friday, we'll be at about 15.2% of our vaccination going to black patients. Uh, now that's still not where it should be. Our goal is to get to at least 17%. Uh, 
Um, we think that um, we're probably only going to be getting vaccine from the governor for another couple of weeks, most likely. We think it's going to transition, as the mayor said, to these state sites and to some of the private pharmacies. Um, but uh, Carlos said that we really need to be above the level in the population uh, for us to feel like we're doing right by the community we serve. Um, I do want to address uh, the chairman's point about going through the social media and going through Twitter. Uh, at this point, because we've been so successful with our community partnerships, and because to the mayor's point, we have started vaccinating people under 65 if they have those high risk conditions, but we're doing it um, with existing Jackson patients. So we're tiering, looking at the most high risk folks, we're calling them, we're emailing them, we're texting them to get them in for appointments. So what you're seeing on the social media is just the handful of appointments that get left every day that haven't been filled through one of these more, uh, I would say proactive partnerships. So if we're doing in some cases three or 4,000 shots a day at our three vaccination sites, maybe three or 400 are going through that public platform that people are seeing on Twitter. So I think that does lend to the frustration people have that those, uh, those appointments are gone within usually 10 or 20 minutes. Um, but it's because we've shifted as much as we can into trying to get to the folks for whom going onto an internet platform is not gonna be the best way of doing it. Um, the next thing that we're gonna be rolling out by the end of this week and why I'm so happy that there are a hundred people at this event tonight that I can uh, beg for help from is on our website, which is www.safeatjackson.org. We're gonna be rolling out four different community education videos, English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and the one that I'm about to show you right now, you'll be the first ones to see it, um, with Dr. Biggs and with Dr. Hansel Tukes from the University of Miami and at Jackson, that specifically talks to some of the things uh, that Dr. Biggs was just talking about, you know, naming and shaming some of the history that creates a very understandable reticence. Um, we're also going to have new frequently asked question documents. We're going to have um, a Zoom town hall meeting like this. We're going to have two of them next Friday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with some of the leading nurses and physicians from the entire health system so that anybody in the public can get their information right from the source. Um, and we're also going to open a speakers bureau so that any of your organizations who want to have one of these healthcare experts participating in your event, that you can have access to those folks. Um, so all of this stuff will be rolling out by the end of the week. Uh, but with your indulgence, I would like to let you guys be the first ones to see this new video uh, that we're going to be rolling out specifically for our Black neighbors. This virus affects Black people. It hits us more harshly than, than non-Blacks. Just knowing that, that it's, if as a Black person you get COVID, your chances of dying are greater than if you're a white person, that's, that's tough. That's, that is not easy to swallow. So if there is something that we can do to prevent that, and that's what this vaccine is, we've been praying for a vaccine, um, we, we, have to, we have to take it. This vaccine is how we end the racial disparities in COVID. Uh, if we vaccinate at high rates, the high rates that we should, we will start to uh, diminish our rates of infection and our rates of death. It's absolutely reasonable to have hesitation about the vaccine because there have been injustices done to our communities since this country was founded. Everybody thinks about Tuskegee. We can't allow them to harm us in the year 2021 because we're scared to get the vaccine because of the evil things they did back then, because then they win. There were over 3,000 people who were black in the Pfizer trial. They recruited our community because they wanted to show us that the vaccine was going to be effective for us. And that was very important. I actually know some people who were in the, the study, uh, in the trials who, um, who I trust. <laughs> um, uh, one of them was an attorney that I, uh, you know, worked with in the past. One of the people who was uh, at the helm of the, the Pfizer vaccine trial trained with me here at Jackson Memorial Hospital, uh, Dr. Ryan Karsner. And I trust Ryan. I trust the, the career scientists and physicians at the FDA to make the right decision. These vaccines are safe, 
uh, beyond effective. I mean, 95% efficacy is like nothing that we have seen uh, other than the, the, the measles shot. And I think one of the other reasons why we, we uh, trust it is that every other vaccine, you get a dead or weakened virus administered. So you actually get the real virus in you, the flu vaccine, rubella, mumps, uh, you know, all of, all of the vaccines, polio, everything. With this one, there is no live virus. The vaccine, um, you know, it's a messenger RNA that they attach the message to that goes in and, you know, help us develop uh, antibodies. This messenger RNA uh, process, scientists have been working on that for decades. I mean, I went to nursing school way back when, and we talked about messenger RNA then. So that's uh, another reason why we, why we trust it. Let's just be frank here, everybody's taking it, and it's the same vaccine. We take it out of the fridge and we don't know who you are. <laughs> when you show up, one it's taken out and thought out and, you know, there and the next person in line is the next vaccine that we pull. It's all equal here. Everybody's getting the same. Everybody's getting the best. I'm very happy that our community has the opportunity to uh, get that vaccine here, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation or, or anything, creed, nationality. As black Americans, we have much higher rates of diabetes and high blood pressure, all the more reason for all of us to get vaccinated. What are the alternatives to not taking this vaccine? The alternatives are the potential of getting a deadly virus that you could get it and it, you might be totally fine, but you could actually give it to your mother, your sister, your brother, your neighbor, your auntie, someone, your child and they might not be fine. And I, that's not something that I think anybody wants to live with, is uh, being the person who transmitted to COVID to their, their parents and killed them. Even if they don't die, but they are left without a limb, we've had people lose their arms, legs, fingers, they have a stroke and can no longer talk, walk, see, and it's all because you carried it to them and you had an opportunity to prevent it. I don't think I can ever do a talk and not address <laughs> the mass social distancing and, and all the safety uh, things that we need to put in place. I hear a lot of people say, you know, well, I have mask fatigue and I'm tired of the mask. We, we have to um, wear the mask, wash our hands and social distance, even with the vaccine. Because until we get a certain number, and the number I'm hearing is 80 percent of the world, of the country, of your community, being uh, vaccinated and immune, we, we're still going to be having this struggle because something we don't know yet, even though somebody is vaccinated and immune, you might not get the virus, but you might be able to still carry it to someone else. This vaccine is safe, it is effective, and this is our only way out of the pandemic. And I highly recommend, particularly black and brown people, to get it. And white people, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Mr. Pinzer, before you, you go anywhere, I just wanted to clarify that stat you just gave. Do you know what other entities, because you said you do 34% of the vaccinations in Miami-Dade County, what other entities are make up that 66%? Sure. So um, at the very beginning in December, you know, all the hospitals got vaccine, and that was for vaccinating their employees and their physicians. So that's part of the 100%. Uh, the state, as the mayor said, is operating these sites at Marlins and at Hard Rock. Uh, the state has also partnered with a very small number of churches in Miami-Dade County and has set up one-day drive-through vaccination sites. Um, I know Pastor Jackson down at Second Baptist did that last week. Um, there's a few others that have done it. Um, and then there are some other clinics that have it. I know CHI down at South Dade has uh, had a supply of it. Um, for a little while, both um, two other health systems, who I won't name, uh, they were doing public appointments as well. Uh, they, because of some issues, they had to stop that program and cancel those appointments. Um, so that's one of the other reasons that we only take appointments a day or two in advance, is we will never make an appointment until we are certain we have the vaccine to deliver on it. So it really is, you know, the mayor keeps saying it's a patchwork. Um, we find out every Friday how many vaccines we're getting for the next week. So when I'm doing partnerships with Pastor Barber or with Pastor Jackson or with anyone else, literally they are standing by, we call them Friday and we say, for next Thursday, can you find 50 people who would come and get it? Can you find 75 people? And I'm literally sitting in my office, Dr. Big sees me all day, every day, building these scheduling templates by hand so that it's easy for the churches to fill them themselves and send them back to us and not have to get trained on some computer system that nobody will ever understand. Thank you. I do have a, another question that was submitted. Uh, I'm going to uh, direct this to Dr. Henderson. Um, Dr. Henderson, do you know if there's any of the RA uh, that has been used for any of the vaccines? Any of the RA? What, can you, what, what's an RA? I think he might be asking about the messenger. Yeah. What? Messenger RA. So the question is it, Messenger it's RNA. Of, has yes. Messenger RA been used with any other vaccines? Was the question. Yeah, it, it has. Um, one of the reasons why we were able to, to get to the vaccine so quickly is because we have developed uh, coronavirus uh, vaccines, not, not the strain uh, COVID 19, but with other coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses in the past, we had developed similar uh, vaccines and, and the mRNA uh, way in which we, we, we were able to, to, to get to the, the vaccine is a new way, it's a novel way, but it, it's not something that, that is uh, completely new to COVID-19. Um, and again, that, that's part of the reason why we were able to get uh, the vaccine so in, in such a record time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell, um, do you have any comments regarding the distribution as a whole, how the distribution is rolling out? Well, uh, thank you and um, uh, thanks uh, Mayor and, and others for inviting me. Uh, the distribution, um, Stanley Campbell, I, um, I have a, a technology company that messages into every point of cell pharmacy in the United States and for the territories. So, uh, and, I, and I do that monitoring every medication available for human or animal consumption. That's about 228,000 national drug codes. So I get to see this problem um, in a very sobering position. Uh, I see people come into the hospital. I see them not leave the hospital. I see medications uh, as they dispense I see multiple different variants. There are 68 different methodologies from states, and there's virtually an unlimited number of methodologies from the city. I actually see the city's methodology, the city of Miami and Dade County, and their methodologies. I just spent um, um, last weekend from Thursday to, to um, Saturday dispensing um, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri where they got police, fire, rescue, but they also brought in elderly. They brought in comorbid. By the time we left on Saturday, they had actually 
um, dosed at um, uh, dispensed in, in the, at homeless centers. The issue there that's different and that I've not heard tonight is those dispensings in the African-American neighbor uh, community are dispensed by African-Americans primarily, meaning there's a methodology for the city uh, as an institutional player to send a one page document with its health authorities to the CDC. That then gives that, ho that ho hospital or that doctor, meaning Dr. Cheryl, if she, uh, Dr. Holder, if she had a, a primary care, if she's as a primary care physician, has her own office. If they gave her that one page, she needs a fiduciary, she needs a clinician, that she is the clinician, and she needs the recommendation for her to get that license. The one thing when, that I tell people as we look at um, health disparities as a whole, and recognizing that I have 260 million Americans in my system, and we prosecute ph pharmacy transactions bi-directionally at every CVS, every Walgreens, every pharmacy, and we do that for 17 of the top pharmacies, pharmacy manufacturers in the world. So Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Novo Nordisk, Novartis, all of them are my clients. And, and based on that, when we see that fact, where we see success in the nation, it is where those people are receiving those vaccines from a trusted entity. My, my parents both went to Jackson. My mother passed away in Jackson. I, I've, I've had Jackson set arm, set broken bones in my, uh, you know, from sports. And we know that. We know that hospital is a trusted entity in our community. But we also know that we cannot ignore folks who are going to look at healthcare in the rearview mirror of Tuskegee. What I do in, in discussion as a scientist, I basically bring things to context. The context of artificial intelligence and neural computing allowed us to look at the RNA vaccines, to model what we can anticipate, and then to advance the knowledge of what we could anticipate in real clinical trial. The, the, we didn't have 50 years ago, we didn't have the genome. We didn't have the compute power to do artificial intelligence. So as we model, as the industry modeled these vaccines, two things came about. One, you could adjust the model back based on what you're seeing out of the clinical trial. But another one is with these telecommunications infrastructures, we could send sensors and devices home. So other than prior clinical trials where we could actually get people to come into the doctor's office every, every week or once a month when you're in a clinical trial with a, with a set of sensors, we can receive 20, 30, 2,000 reports back a day. So this vaccine, these vaccines have been built and made with the most advanced science in the history of the world. And it's proven out in their efficacy. It's proving out in the scoring. But at the end of the day, if you're not trusted, it doesn't matter how well your logic is. And if you don't trust the technology, it does not matter how well the efficacy is. So you basically have got to get these clinicians licensed. And then lastly, one of the other things that, um, that I see and that we see nationally and where we see success at, at, at fair levels is what I would call it, is testing. We're talking heavily about the vaccine, but just yesterday uh, we've got now the, 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 um, the, the pivot and, and you're gonna see another eight or 10 pivots. The first pivot we, we just saw is that in other countries and as well this one, the pivot to be able to extend the time because we've got to release all vaccines to get the first dose in the arm. That's a pivot. The other pivot is the pivot to being able to um, present um, the vaccine in a way that we might have to extend the time. And remembering, all of us remember, the management of this vaccine is on a card. 
a cart that was originally developed in 1945. So that uh, and, and the most advanced technology um, uh, enterprise in the history of the world. And then when we look at Twitter, not only do we not have Twitter in, in, in these neighborhoods, but we also don't have smart devices. We also don't have um, access to the internet. We also don't have um, the ability to do telehealth. And in, the, in these communities, if you don't have an ability to do telehealth, that means you don't have an ability to get health in some cases. And in, and in fact, if you drop the AIDS down, you might not also not have a, a, a access to education. So the, the, the successes and probably the biggest one to get the most attention is testing. Do the test because the next pivot you're going to see coming out of warp speed is the fact that we're going to now move to who not just deserves the, the vaccine, as, uh, as uh, Jackson eloquently put, I will, I will vaccinate a person who is 45 years old and has three comorbidities. I'm a Navy pilot. I just turned 65. All of my classmates have to leave the airlines. Those are 65 plus year olds who are in the best shape because they had to take two physicals uh, a year. Do they, res do they qualify for that vaccine but more importantly than that 45 year old with hypertension and diabetes or that 35 year old with, with um, asthma and, and congestive heart failure. So the next pivot is going to be who is the sickest of the sick and who is impacting the healthcare system the most, which should have been where we started had we had enough knowledge and we had enough experience and we had enough exposure to these kinds of problems. And the problem we really have is we did. When we had anthrax, they, there was a hospital when we, when we had the anthrax attack that every single patient lived and every other patient in other hospitals passed away. That's where we learned the protocols necessary to to toward this disease. And what we can do in testing is identify where those hotspots are. We will take the fire truck to where the fire is. That's the next pivot. The pivot that you're gonna experience now is these vaccines will get into pharmacies. That is the way the administration has decided to bypass governors. It's going straight to pharmacies because the governors and the administrations have not done this fair and equitable job, which is what the Miami Hero, the Miami Hero from this position that we said, just evidence one city. We see this disparity consistently across the nation. And so the thing that I would say to, in, 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 in closing of, of, of my comment is please, Make, take that one page document, get people doctors, because these are also the same doctors in these communities. They are also disproportionately affected economically. And those populations trust them. So if we can get them one page document, take seven days, CDC sends that license back, they can start vaccinating immediately. That is their population. The disparity, no matter how great the, the film and video, you can't go where you don't know. Thank you. Right. Thank Thank you. So, so Mr. Mr. Thomas, I just want to, and Ms. Sears, I just want to let you know that two uh, hands are raised, Mr. Wright and Mr. Jacobs. Okay, uh, before we go there, I did want to have, uh, one follow-up for Mr. Pinzer as far as the Zoom. Um, can you put out that Zoom information out again? And also, if um, a person does not have access to technology, uh, is there a conference call that might be available also? So you're talking about the town hall meetings that we're going to do next Friday, which is yes. February 12th uh, at uh, 10 a.m. and at 6 p.m. 
All the information for that will be by the end of this week at www.safeatjackson.org. Um, and I will look into whether there's gonna be a phone call in number or if it's just gonna be the link. And I will get that information back to uh, Ms. Ritha, who I know has been serving this organization very well for a long time. She's um, one of the jewels over in county government. I know she'll help get that information out. Thank you. And those two hands, can you repeat those two hands for me? Uh, Mr. 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 Wright and Mr. Jacobs. Uh, Mr. Wright. Uh, uh, my, my, I have a two part question. My question is, uh, the first part of it is directed to um, uh, Dr. Holder. Um, the, the, the scenario that's coming out now, um, you know, as far as getting people to participate in taking this vaccine, uh, uh, personally, I see a lot of confusion coming down because right now you got Pfizer and you have Moderna where you have to have these extreme cold temperatures to have it and you have to do two tests, you have to get two doses of it. And now the big hype that came up on TV today with the news media, they're, they're, they're really focusing in on this J&J &J and possibly AstraZeneca coming on board where it's a one dose vaccine and you can keep it in the refrigerator. And, and I, I just think it's, 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 it's some confusion going on. And then who's gonna get the, the two dose and who's gonna get the, the one dose? And, 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 and I just think that's planting the seed in people's mind and saying, well, it does, what's going on? It does seem confusing, but it really is how, I mean, we're in a business and we have many pharmaceutical companies. So I think of it like when you're going grocery shopping, you will see ketchup, you'll see Heinz, you'll see Grace, you'll see a bunch of different options. So what happens in this race, does, we're losing millions of people. And this, back, this infection, if it goes across the world and even 1% of the population dies, that's hundreds of millions of people. But what we're we're in the race to save lives. And in trying to save lives, every pharmaceutical company should get on board and find the vaccine that's easiest to use, that will protect you, best to prevent the infection. But if it can't prevent the infection, can it stop you from dying, from getting severe disease? So we have about, I think at the last count, there might be 50 drug, 50 companies and 50 possible vaccines in the pipeline across the world because everybody's at a race to save lives. So what has happened is that the two companies that came out, Pfizer and Moderna, they were first because their vaccine was different. It was built like Dr. Henderson talked about. It was built on previous technology, previous platforms. So they're able to just tweak the genetic code and make this new vaccine. Johnson & Johnson used the older way of making it so theirs came a little bit later. And theirs is more like the flu vaccine where you get one. It is not as strong overall in protecting you from getting severe disease, but it's good enough that it probably, you won't get severe disease. And so our goal is the, the goal of any new infection or any disease, can we cure you? And can we prevent you from dying of it? We can't cure this right off, you're the only one, the people can cure it themselves. But if you get very sick, we don't have anything to really say we're gonna save you 100% of the time. So we don't have an effective treatment that you just take like you would if you had um, any other kind of infection. So these companies are all in the battle to try and save as many lives worldwide. And if we can get a vaccine that one shot will save you from ending up on a ventilator, then we go with the one shot. The two shots is because the way the mechanism works, your body, it builds on your body to make these, the chemicals to go fight the infection in case you see it. You need the first shot to get your body kind of primed up. It's kind of like in the morning when you wake up, you're kind of creaky. And as you keep going by the end of the day, you kind of ease up and you feel looser. Your body needs to get that first shot to prime it. Then the second shot takes you to the top where you can have enough fighting power that if you get exposed to this infection, you're gonna fight it off. You're not gonna end up in anybody's hospital 
You may keep it in your nose, but you're not going to end up in the hospital. And so that's our goal. When I say the risk benefits alternative, the risk of the little aches and pains of the vaccine is way less than somebody who's older and end up with a pneumonia or dying. So that's why it seems complicated, but it's just having your options of whether you get this vaccine, that vaccine, but they're all going towards the same goal, not having you get severe disease and increasing your risk of dying. And there are different ways of fighting this bacteria, this, um, not bacteria, this virus. So the Moderna goes after a part of it called the spike protein and the Pfizer. The J&J &J uses another part of the virus and everybody's coming at it at different ways. It's like, how do I skin a cat? I'm gonna skin it all different ways so I can have some vaccines out there that the entire world, we're not just talking about the US, this is every country in the world needs vaccines. So we have to have different ways of getting that vaccine to the market to get people immunized so we can prevent severe disease and death. Hopefully we'll get a cure. Thank you. Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright, real fast, uh, is your second question short? Because yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And My second like, question is directed, I would like to be directed to Dr. Henderson to bring him in. The second question. Well, I wanted to ask Mr. Penzer my second question okay. About, okay. The, about the video he showed. Um, it was a great video with, with, with Dr. Biggs and Dr. Tooks, but I, I didn't see anything that said to, 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 to show people, you, you gave information, but you didn't show people the impact. Like on national media, they're actually showing people who are, who are dealing with these ventilators and the positions that you have to be in. And, and I think for our community, you have to, to, to be impactful and show them, this is what can happen to you. You don't wanna be here. Um, I agree with you very much. And we have content like that as well. Um, so we spoke to a lot of the partners who we've been working with about what they felt would be most impactful uh, in the venues that they're going to use it. A lot of that was with the pastors. We're really hoping to get this shown during the streaming services. Um, and a lot of the feedback that we got was for that particular use, this was what they felt would be the most effective. But I'm happy to work with you offline and get you some of that additional content that we have. There's been some really great news coverage. We've had not just local media, but we've allowed some of the networks to come onto our COVID units. Dr. Biggs has been a part of it. We have shown that we have let people hear directly from the patients, from the family members, from the nurses and doctors who are working on those units. You know, Dr. Biggs can talk about, literally we have nurses who are suffering from PTSD because of what they have seen. Maybe she can uh, chime in for a minute because I don't want to speak for her. She's uh, oh, much wiser than I am. Close up this session real quick. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Biggs, but we want to go to Dr. Jacobs, I mean to uh, Mr. Jacobs uh, real quick because uh, we have to move on to the next session. Absolutely. A very quick question here for you, Mr. Pinzer. Um, I want to say that about last week or maybe two weeks ago, uh, the New York Times had uh, published an op-ed about how certain people, it looks like you're shaking your head, so I won't even go into the details of the op-ed since you seem to be familiar with, but for those watching, it just talked about how people are jumping the vaccine line and how you know people that aren't in the required age group um, are getting vaccines, board members, friends. I think all of us in some capacity probably have heard of the doctor, daughter, friend who got a vaccine. We're like, how did this happen? Uh, so I'm just really curious. And obviously, I don't know um, if that's happened uh, with the vaccines that UM has had, but obviously it is a prevalent problem. And obviously people from the black community look onto that and say, hey, I can't even get a fair shake to get a vaccine when I'm in the protected classes to get it. So I'm curious what, if anything at all, has a UM done to either curb that uh, from occurring or to look prospectively to say, these are the safeguards we put into place so that it doesn't occur uh, with our vaccinations. Sure, let me clarify, UM and Jackson are not the same. Um, a lot of people are under that misapprehension. UM is a private organization. Um, they have a lot of our doctors are from UM, but they are not part of the, the government. So I can't speak for them at all. Um, they had a small amount of vaccine that they just used for their employees and I think for some of their high risk patients, but everything that uh, Dr. Biggs and I have been speaking about is what's happening on the Jackson side. Um, so there are, when you come in, uh, there are two ways to get a vaccine appointment at Jackson. 
right? Either it's one of them that we talked about, right? Getting on the public platform or through one of the churches, something like that, or the invitation from Jackson. You're not getting the invitation from Jackson unless you meet those criteria. That's extremely strict. When people are booking appointments, whether it's through the church, through the community group or directly online, we're telling them in advance, if you show up, you've got to have your ID that has your birth date. And if you don't meet these qualifications, you're going to be turned away. Once you get to the vaccine site, there are not one, not two, not three, four different places at which we check your age before you get that shot in your arm. And when we, I will be honest, when we are moving three, 4,000 people a day through the sites, there are people who have made it all the way to that fourth step before somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute, your birthday is not for another four months, right? And I've had angry leaders in our community call me and say, I turned 65 in three weeks. How dare you turn me away? And my answer is because you're not 65 yet, sir. And every single dose of this vaccine is being tracked in a statewide database called Florida Shots. And they are auditing what we put in there. And again, total honesty, a couple of people have snuck through. I'm aware of in the low double digits, the number of people who were below 65, who just, they made it through those four checkpoints and the staff is moving fast and trying to, to do it all in the right way. And on those low double digits, you know, again, I think it's 30 or 40, we've gotten calls. And the state has said, what happened here? And the CEO has gone right to the head of operations for it. And he has said, I want an explanation of each and every one of these. Doesn't mean we punish anyone, but if there's one of our sites, if there's one of our registrar people who needs to be re-educated, if we need to put better visual aids out there, if the person's birth date was before this date, do not vaccinate. And we've learned as we've gone. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that we've managed to, I think, hold the line really, really effectively and sometimes had to make wrenching decisions. You know, people who really, in our hearts, we want to give that vaccine to, but they don't meet the criteria. So we've managed to hold that line while also the experience that we've had, and I know some of y'all on this call have been vaccinated at Jackson or have loved ones who have, uh, in a good week before COVID, I would get five or six reviews on Google for a Jackson hospital. Since we started vaccination, I am getting on average two to 300 five-star reviews every week because people are not only having a good experience, they're being treated with respect. They're being treated with warmth. The wait time is usually 10 or 15 minutes. People are in and out 30 or 40 minutes and that's after they've been under observation for 15 minutes. So when you as a community have called upon us to step up and do this for you, we have not only done it with the kind of clinical excellence that Dr. Biggs and her nurses bring every day, uh, but I think we've done it in a way that again shows Jackson is the healthcare system for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Vincer. Uh, and with that, uh, we're gonna close out this session. Wait, Mr. wait, 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 Dr. D Dr. Henderson. Uh, no, the homeless. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I, I, I apologize. Um, uh, we. We did have one last question and it just came on Facebook Live and because it's public forum, I need to read it and anyone can answer it, which is what are the numbers of the three vari variants, UK, South African and Brazil being seen in Miami-Dade County and how is Miami-Dade going to deal with the vaccine's efficacy against these variants? I don't know. Oh, no. By the way, I don't know if it is, is, is a fair answer, but... but yeah, but I don't think we've seen the Brazilian yet. I thought we had the UK variant already shown in Florida. And we are at any city that has a high rate of transmission and high numbers will be at risk for variants. So that's why it's so important that we wear our masks, socially distance, get our vaccines to bring the rate of transmission down because whether it comes in from abroad or it's generated from within, which is what we probably see, because every time you get infected and you pass this, back, this virus on, virus mutates, that's what they do. So that's why we have to stop the transmission in social with our mask or we try and stop it with our vaccines, but we have to stop it because the variants will come from within our community. But I think the British version is here. The vaccines work well against them that you don't get severe disease. The Brazilian one is a very complicated that may be 
and they're already looking at tweaking the vaccine so we might need a booster in the future. But if you wear your mask and protect yourself with the vaccine, you won't get a high enough of dose of the, the dosing that you get from the infection is also important. So that's why masking is important. So if you're going to get exposed to the Brazilian or any of the others, but you get a small amount because you wear the mask, the other person wore the mask and you didn't get very much in you and you are immunized, your body should be able to mount enough a response where you don't get severe disease. Our goal again is no severity, no pneumonia, no hospitalization. You get a little cold and you stay home. And that will happen with the mask and your vaccine at the current mutations that we're seeing now. But you could get a super bug if we do not stop transmission and stopping everybody from passing this virus on, on and on and on. Virus mutates. That's the life cycle of a virus. We got to stop it. Thank you, Dr. Holder. Uh, with that, we're going to close out this session and I'm turning it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all very much. Um, just for our guests and uh, our uh, uh, board members whose hands were raised, uh, if you get Reetha your questions, we'll go ahead and get them out and they'll be part of our final report. Uh, so the public understands there will be a final report that comes out and will be presented to the uh, county commission and the mayor's office. Um, hopefully we can, we can see some improvements and some numbers, um, but we appreciate each and every one of you for taking time this evening uh, yeah. to educate the community. Um, with that said, we're going to transition and I thank both Ms. Sears and, and Mr. Thomas for, for, for their work moderating that panel. But we are, gonna, we are going to transition to our second panel. <clears throat> I think uh, Mr. Rutledge, uh, Mr. Jacobs and uh, Ms. McMillan. Yes. I think Mr. Jacobs will lead us off. Thank you, Mr. Ruffledge. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, so we are heading up the, one second, let me pull up the right one here. Millennials always think they have all the answers and look at them, not prepared. <laughs> <for that. laughs> you know, we actually never think that because all of you remind us that we don't. So there's that. So we're heading up the education, social justice and economics panel. Uh, we have a, a, a great panel here prepared, a, a team of individuals uh, Mr. Justin Penn, Dr. Steve Gallen, Dr. Jeffress Hardrick, Stanley Campbell, Rick Beasley, and Alita Harris. Um, I'm going to read all of their bios and introduce them to you. And then I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Ruflish to kind of start the conversation here. Just Ron. to let you know, uh, Stanley Campbell was on the last panel. Right. Oh, okay. Ronnie, you only have to read the bio of uh, Mr. Penn. Mr. Penn? Okay. Oh, Mr. Gallon is here as well, but um, do we got it under control. Okay, got it. Uh, so, Mr. Justin Penn, Mr. Justin Penn is a former Miami Dade County Public School science teacher and currently works with Teach for America Miami Dade as director of, of Alumni Strategic Initiatives, where he supports the leadership of TFA's over 650 plus leaders in the greater Miami Dade area. Justin serves on the board of several nonprofits in our community and is passionate about elevating and empowering the voices and leadership of young people and those from underserved communities. Okay. You're good. Ms. McMillan. All right. Dr. Steve Gallon the third. <clears throat> Dr. Steve Gallon the third is currently the vice chair and elected district one school board member for the Miami Dade County Public Schools. Dr. Gallen is a lifelong, lifelong educator who started his career as a classroom teacher. He has taught at the elementary, middle, and senior high school levels. He graduated from Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida, and earned a master's degree in educational leadership and a doctorate in educational administration and supervision, both from Florida International University. He also participated in postdoctoral leadership institutes on school reform and management at Harvard and Stanford University. Welcome, Dr. Gallen. 
In the essence of time, um, the next panelist is Dr. Jesus, Jafus Hardrick. He's currently the president of Florida Memorial University, South Florida's only HBCU and award-winning senior academic executive with a proven track record for promoting student success, enhancing student outcomes, optimizing faculty and staff development, and cultivating a culture of excellence. Dr. Hardrick fully understands the promise of education. He served as the vice provost for access and success at Florida International University, the nation's fourth largest public urban research university. Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs at Baylor University. As an education executive, he is committed to developing future leaders and closing achievement gaps among underrepresented students and creating a culture of academic excellence in higher education. He's also the co-author of Making Global Learning Universal, Promoting Inclusion and Success for All Students. Welcome, Dr. Jafis Harkin. Our next panelist, and I call him a friend, is none other than Rick Beasley. He served as the executive director of the South Florida Workforce Investment Board, also known as CareerSource South Florida, since August of 2005. In this position, he oversees workforce programs in Miami-Dade and Monroe counties with an operating budget of $75 million. He oversees one of the nation's most dynamic melting pots a diverse socioeconomic region. His vision for Career Source South Florida is to create a model for the nation by establishing a world-class talent supply chain that fosters economic growth. We welcome Mr. Rick Beasley. Ms. Althea A. Harris. Ms. Harris has been helping businesses for over her 27 year federal career most of them in the South Florida District Office of the U.S. Small Business Administration. She leads the marketing and outreach team serving the district's 24 county territory and advocates on behalf of the over 1.2 million small business owners in these counties. A graduate of Howard University and the University of Miami School of Law, Athea is also active in her community currently serving as a board member of the Miami Youth for Christ and as board vice chair of Christ at Christ Journey Church in Gables. A Washington DC native, Althea as shares her life and love with her husband, Robert H. Robert N. Harris, a successful commercial labor and employment litigation attorney in Miami and their four wonderful children. Thank you. Glad to be with y'all tonight. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, can we just start with the questions? I know we're pressed for time, but I want everybody to get an opportunity to speak. So my feeling on press for time, it's we're on the people's time. And although we, we hope to end at nine and I don't want to waste anybody's time, the information that, that our panelists have about education, about uh, uh, business, they need to get the information out. So okay. I wouldn't press them. Uh, let them let them give their information. All right. With that being said, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll start it off. Um, and this is probably for Vice Chair um, Dr. Steve Gallon III and Dr. Hardrick. In this COVID environment, how has the educational delivery model been affected in both K-12 and higher ed? And what does the future look like moving forward? Um, I'll, I'll, I know you specifically indicated higher ed. Um, I can defer to Dr. Hardrick on that. I'll be uh, more than willing to speak to the K-12 experience, uh, but you specifically said higher ed, so uh, I'll defer to him and then you can come back with respect to the K-12 if you would like. No, you can go ahead and start. That's it. Uh, affected in both K-12. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, I've, I've, I've said consistently at the onset of the pandemic that uh, when things are bad across the country, things are actually worse for Black children and Black communities and underserved communities. In this educational environment, it's been no different. Uh, this has been uh, extremely vexing 
uh, to not only the educational experience, but more importantly, the education of our children. Uh, we've had some discussions relative to academic regression, which is a reality. Uh, the, the dual modality has been a challenge, obviously, in underserviced communities, because at the end of the day, it comes down to an equity issue. Uh, many of our children in certain homes and communities and zip codes, usually communities of color, black communities, uh, have limited access. So it's an access gap to technology. It's an access gap to having the reinforcement in the homes. And that's going to play itself out in the achievement gap at the onset, uh, at the conclusion of this pandemic. So uh, this is going to have some uh, adverse impacts on our children's educational experiences now and in the future. And, and we're very, very concerned that this can be something that lingers for generations to come. So let me say good evening to uh, all of the uh, participants and the organizers of this conversation. Um, uh, honestly, as um, Dr. Gallen has uh, articulated, um, the impact of this current environment on K through 12, let me tell you, it's also impacting higher ed in the same manner. What we've realized is that even we at Florida Memorial, despite all of the growth that we were beginning to experience at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, it really impacted our enrollment by 20%, simply because many of our parents lost their jobs and they were expecting their sons and daughters, they could not afford to continue to pay the education. Uh, they were expecting them to be able to go home and work in order to just help uh, uh, meet the ends and the, the impact on, on their families economically. So we're seeing this. We're seeing that the learning gaps continue, not only from K through 12, but higher ed as well. The, the pivot from your traditional um, learning environments to an online or virtual environment is it's, it's really, um, it's not one that's highly embraced by many of uh, the students from our, our populations. And we realized that when we looked at the data, many of our students struggled uh, simply because they were not ready uh, and, and accustomed to uh, the virtual learning environments. And so, so we are like Dr. Gallen, we are seeing now and having to make some serious adjustments. And um, because so many of our students, they're struggling. They were struggling with this environment and, and we're now having to uh, <coughs> offer this semester, we're offering face-to-face -face as well as uh, uh, online learning so that we can provide the high touch to many of the students who are coming to our universities. Because let me just tell you at Florida Memorial, We've been educating students for 141 years. And oftentimes we have students who are coming into the institution who are not, not, may not have the strongest background, but once they, they encounter the, the faculty and staff and that, that are committed to them, the high touch, we're able to make them feel comfortable and, and confident in their abilities to learn. And we're seeing the impact uh, that this environment is having on, on that transition, uh, if you will, for many of our students. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, can I just uh, make a final, final follow-up point? Sure. Um, education is predicated, quite frankly, on a simple proposition. And that proposition is predicated based on research, based on practice, and quite frankly, based on science, is that exchange between a teacher and a student. The current delivery of education as we see it right now has uh, totally disrupted the ability for a teacher and a student to be involved in a physical, emotional, mental, uh, personal exchange. Uh, there is no substitute for a highly effective, highly dedicated, caring and committed teacher. So with respect to uh, how the pandemic has affected that, it has totally uh, disrupted the core uh, technology, the core purpose and the core uh, function of education, which is that exchange between a, a human being uh, in a classroom that represents a teacher and a student that represents the learner. So 
that is obviously going to adversely impact all children. But what we do know relative to the inequities that often vex our uh, public uh, educational system and society at large, our black children are going to be uh, even more uh, adversely impacted uh, in years to come. Yes. Also, Dr. Gallen, um, as we're talking about the um, adverse impacts upon our children, we have missing kindergarten kids or pre-K kindergarten. There's a, a number I've heard within the school district. I hope those numbers have um, dropped and there's more children actually logging on or signing in for schools or whatever, but that is definitely a huge impact uh, and thanks to COVID, the digital divide is another serious problem where homes are, don't have access to the right technology, bandwidths in the homes don't work. So some of the things we can handle or whatever on one end, but on the other end, there's has to be some, I guess, more collaboration or uh, working together I know there's uh, uh, some information out from the Florida Chamber that wants to be assured that every child will be, will graduate by 2030. So they, and they're putting together a plan. So what are some of the opportunities that you see that we can sort of um, bring our children together, our communities together, work with the parents uh, so that we can start on our end to do some of these things? Uh, excellent point. And, and as I indicated just previously, as you all can see, I'm in the office. Uh, we had a long day down here at the district, started out at 11 in committee, and uh, mm -hmm. we just wrapped up. I, I presented an item dealing with the achievement gap. And one of the things that I represented there is that the school district uh, has an obligation educationally to do certain things. But our work is not going to be successful if we don't have the collective input and involvement of all of our community stakeholders, specifically our parents. Parents are the primary educators of our children. And I've often said, having been a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent of schools, I've not found a parent that does not care about their child and wants what's best for them. Uh, what we have found is that parents have uh, sometimes difficulty navigating the system. And so what can we do? We can serve as a conduit. Uh, those of us that know better can help our parents do better. We can help them navigate the system, make sure that they connect uh, their children, their homes uh, with the necessary resources, be it technology, be it a teacher, be it a, a social worker, be it a, a special needs uh, expert. Uh, we have to help our parents navigate uh, through the school system under normal circumstances, Ms. McMillan, but under these circumstances, it's even critically more important. So the school system is relying on that element of outreach uh, that element of, of connectivity, and I don't mean technology, meaning connecting parents to the system. If you know a parent that uh, whose child doesn't have a device, we need to know about that, starting at the school site level, but ultimately uh, through the superintendent and ultimately to the board. And I get a lot of uh, requests for that via technology, via social media. So, you know, we do what we can where we can. So uh, how we are able to help this particular situation is being a resource uh, and a conduit to our parents who uh, represent often the least, the last, and the lost with respect to this very difficult, large nation's fourth largest school district, which is a, a, a tremendous bureaucracy. And our parents are already having a difficult time. So we need to really uh, help them connect to the resources. And I'll say lastly, uh, yes, we deliver educational services, reading, writing, uh, science, social studies, and et cetera. But our schools provide other supports to families and to children. Uh, breakfast, lunch, a snack, but more importantly, that level of stability. So uh, we're here. There's been a, a major discourse about whether or not schools should be open or closed. Uh, our public schools are a significant uh, resource for parents who have to work, parents who need to give their children educational continuity, and again, uh, schools providing the basic needs for many of our children and families. So uh, we need everybody to put their shoulder to the will of this work, to be a conduit, and to uh, hold all of us accountable, because at the end of the day, we are all responsible for the education and uplift of our children. Thank you. If I, if I can, I would love to jump in on that question, because two of the organizations I represent um, impact that. May I? For sure. 
All right. Well, good evening. I'm truly grateful and honored to be here with you all for such an important conversation about the community we all love and to be on a panel with so many community giants and dedicated leaders. Um, now, as we've all witnessed, COVID-19 has presented our community with unprecedented challenges. Um, it's raised and broadened the awareness regarding the vast inequity that is present within our community. However, what this pandemic has also provided is an opportunity, the opportunity to meet the moment, an opportunity for us to address the systemic challenges and inequities in partnership with the communities we serve and live in, um, just as Dr. Gallen has referenced. The organizations I represent, Teach for America Miami-Dade and Miami at Tech um, are, um, that I'm representing this evening, are trying to meet this moment, are working to meet this moment to create equity, access, and opportunity. Um, I'll share a little bit about Teach for America's impact, then I'll also go into Miami Ed Tech. Um, at Teach for America, uh, we're working to ensure our teachers and students have the resource they need to teach and learn remotely. Uh, through coaches, regional supports, and national resources, we're working around the clock to support our teachers to foster student learning in a new virtual environment. Uh, we're working closely with our teachers, drawing on best practices from across our network and learning rapidly as we go. Uh, we're committed to doing whatever it takes to support our teachers to, uh, to better meet their students' needs in a virtual and or in-person um, setting. Now, we, we at Teach for America realize and believe that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Um, this is why our Teach for TFA teachers are working to do whatever it takes to provide our students with opportunities to level the playing field and provide equity and access in order to meet the great moment. To provide some examples of the impact um, in pursuit of equity and opportunity and access, just recently, we've had a um, rock star TFA leader at Miami Northwestern Senior High School in her second year of teaching, write a grant and secure dollars to make sure her chemistry students had success, had um, access to iPads and hotspots they need to access college level science, technology, and engineering mathematic materials in her classroom. We've also had teacher leaders in our network working with Guitars Over Guns, an after school nonprofit to provide virtual after school programs and music to engage and support our students. They're ensuring that their students are not only getting music instruction from talented musicians, but also working to make sure their students receive academic homework support and lessons to improve social emotional learning. Now, another example fueled by Miami Ed Tech, we have a TFA teacher leader in his second year of teaching, something about our second year teachers, uh, started an AP computer science program at his placement school, Booker T. Washington Senior High School. The impact of uh, students at Booker T. being able to embrace, have access to, and ownership of computer science uh, through um, have access to computer science is just phenomenal. It's transformative. We hope to continue this spread and grow it with multiple teachers. Now, all in all, these are so many examples. I mean, there's teachers that have been using TikTok and other ways to engage their students in the pandemic, but our network of TFA leaders are deeply committed uh, to this because we all make a lifetime commitment that first begins in the classroom to ensure that our students have access to and can receive an excellent education. We do this because our children in Miami-Dade are the greatest treasures our community possesses. And we are very proud and honored to be doing this in partnership with the Miami-Dade County Public School System. Now, I know what was referenced also was the digital divide. Um, I happen to be the board chair of Miami Ed Tech and we have a, an incredible founder who has an incredible vision, who's been working to equip teachers and students with skill sets and knowledge to navigate, uh, to be able to navigate and have ownership in a fast growing world of computer science. Uh, just this last year, Miami Ed Tech, in partnership with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, provided computer science training and access to curriculum for over 600 teachers in our district. So they have the ability to implement rigorous computer science instruction at the level demanded that will be necessary in our 21st century economy. Um, and we've referenced the, uh, the digital divide. I mean, in our community, in some of our most neatest neighborhoods, about 42% of our residents go without reliable internet access, largely along the lines of the Black community. Um, I can proud to say that it takes organizations to work in partnership like Miami Ed Tech with Miami Foundation and Achieve Miami. We're embarking on a joint effort to help close the digital divide in our community with what will be called Miami Connected. Uh, this will expand internet access via Comcast to our most vulnerable communities, ensure students and families have access to high-speed internet. Um, it takes these types of partnerships like the, like this, um, the school board member Dr. Gallon has referenced and we're all about it and making sure we can be part of that to help do it. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that was a pretty robust um, section on education, our challenges, and some of the, the things that we can do to help uh, bridge that digital divide. Um, let's talk about business. We have Ms. Harris on here from the SBA, and we also, who provides loans for businesses, et cetera. And then we have Mr. Beasley on here who actually gets those bodies to those jobs once they're created. Um, We'll back up for a minute and let you all talk. How is that working in this COVID environment in the middle of a pandemic when so many people are um, out of work and unemployed? Right. Well, if you if you don't mind, uh, Rick, I'll go first and um, really represent the federal government 
uh, aspect of all of the COVID relief. SBA, along with Treasury, we've been uh, responsible for getting COVID relief dollars out to small businesses uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program, both in 2020 as a result of the CARES Act, and then again uh, in the Economic Aid Act that is impacting 2021. And um, we're talking about billions of dollars. <clears throat> in 2020, the Paycheck Protection Program closed in August with $130 billion left and available for small businesses uh, to access to help pay for their employees' payroll and some additional expenses, um, allowable expenses. In 2021, uh, we have, uh, again, the Congress has funded the PPP and we're seeing uh, gangbuster uh, numbers. Um, the criticism last year was that small, small businesses were not able to access the PPP. And we have made uh, some changes in the way that we're doing uh, that lending this year so that we make sure that the smallest small businesses have access to those dollars that minority owned firms have access to those dollars as well. And um, right now, uh, I'm happy to say that Florida, <clears throat> we're in the top five for PPP uh, loans to small businesses. Over 51,000 uh, small businesses in the state of Florida have already gotten PPP loans this year. Uh, and the value of those loans is $3.6 billion. Um, so, you know, we've been really working hard here in the South Florida District Office to get the word out. Um, by way of national numbers, uh, we've done almost 900,000 PPP loans uh, valued at uh, $72.7 .7 billion. And the average uh, loan size is uh, less than $82,000. So what we're seeing is that a great number of small businesses are the ones getting uh, these loans. Now, um, one of the interesting things when I was looking at the data is that we see um, so far that African-American owned businesses since the PPP started in this calendar year, uh, almost 20, 1,500 uh, black owned businesses across the country have gotten PPP loans and the value of those loans is almost $570 million. Um, so I'm glad to say that um, we know at least that number, but the vast majority of PPP loans have no demographic uh, data attached to them. So it's likely that even more African-American owned businesses are getting PPP mm -hmm. loans. Uh, similarly, SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, again, Florida, we're in the top four uh, in terms of uh, loans getting out to small businesses. Um, and so we're happy about um, the way that we're getting the money out uh, to small businesses, I think that Rick probably will have a, a really interesting uh, take on what's happening in our economy. Uh, in as much as the federal government has made provision for uh, payment uh, uh, employees, but I wonder, uh, you know, because we do know that folks have laid off um, their employees during this very challenging time. Um, we're doing everything that we can to ensure that they are able to hire them back. Um, but, you know, once a, a business owner goes out of business, there is no coming back, uh, PPP loan or none. So um, we're active. Uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is still open. Uh, if you know any business owners who have not yet taken advantage of that loan, uh, it's a 30-year loan at 2.75% simple interest for nonprofits, including religious organizations, 3.75% for small businesses. You don't have to begin paying on the loan for 12 months. And uh, the Economic Aid Act um, uh, says that SBA will 
uh, as it relates to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance, which was a grant program created by the CARES Act, we are now required to, for uh, business owners who applied for that grant and did not receive the full $10,000, SBA is uh, required to uh, ensure that uh, those applicants who are in low income areas who did not get the full $10,000 and who have uh, experienced a reduction in their gross receipts will be made whole to $10,000. Um, there is nothing that those business owners need to do except wait and respond to an email that will come from the SBA inviting them to uh, share their documentation. Uh, and once we uh, approve all of that, uh, those folks who say only got $1,000 will receive an additional $9,000 to, to $10,000. So whatever shortfall there was in that program, the first priority folks are those in uh, low income areas who applied, who have that reduction and can demonstrate it. And then we're going to move to the second priority folks who are folks who may have applied for that grant uh, but the money ran out before they could obtain it. And then the third priority group will be if there's any money left over uh, for folks who want to apply for that. But we are far from uh, that third group. Our, our priority is that first priority group. And I'm hoping that that will be meaningful to um, Black businesses in Miami-Dade County um, who have experienced that dramatic drop in their gross receipts and who did apply to the SBA for that grant. Um, so I'm hoping that that's some good news on the horizon. We also have this Shuttered Venues Operators Grant um, that we're rolling out uh, any day now. We'll have those details so that uh, those venues like movie theaters and theaters and outdoor venues that haven't been able to uh, be operational will be able to obtain a grant to assist them uh, during this time period as we all make the adjustment. I'm hoping uh, that we're get, making the adjustment to getting back together again. But uh, in the meantime, we do have that program also rolling out. So we're active answering questions, having and hosting webinars. I urge you all to reach out to us if you have questions. Please check out our website. Anything you want to know about the PPP is there, sba.gov forward slash PPP. In fact, all of the data I shared with you is also there and will be continuously updated. Thank you so much. Well, good Mr. evening. Please, I guess you're up, you're on mute. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I've took myself off. I was trying to be patient while uh, my good friend Althea finished, but uh, to, uh, to the Black Fairs Advisory Board, I wanna say thank you and also applaud you for having this forum on uh, state of Black America, uh, state of Black Miami, and particularly through this pandemic. And then to my panelists, it's so good to see my good friends, Althea and Dr. Harderick and uh, Dr. Gallen. And I got a chance to meet and hear some wonderful things that uh, Mr. Penn is doing. And so I wanna to touch base with you, Mr. Penn, once we get off. Uh, so let me share with everyone what Career Source South Florida is doing. Uh, Althea touched on terms of the business community. Uh, and because the business community is our primary customer, really our only customer, and our job seekers, those who have been laid off, are truly uh, our talent, our, our talent pool, which, which we work from. The first thing we did uh, during the temp pandemic, we had to pivot like anyone else, uh, everyone else that uh, businesses had to change how they provided their model, as well as government and so career source had to do the same. Some of the things that we launched uh, one was a reemployment hub. And so there's still a number of folks who are still having a number of difficulties filing or even receiving their unemployment benefits. So we launched a reemployment hub, and some of you all who we worked with in the past remember in 2008, 2009, we did the same thing. So we have a telephone number that we expect everyone, just a call. If you're still having problems receiving your unemployment benefits, I'm going to give a telephone number, 305. 929-1547. Again, 305-929-1547.
we put that number there for, for two purposes. Because we had to pivot and we had to close our offices. Now they're open, but they're open for appointment only. However, if you call that number, we're there to assist you to help you reset your pin, to give you some update on where your unemployment benefits are, but just there just to provide some assistance because of unemployment. And, and we all know what happened when the pandemic hit. The unemployment system is not a career source uh, project. It is something that's held through the Department of Economic Opportunity. But I will tell you in partnership with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Miami-Dade County Library System, we actually were able to go in and pick up paper applications. And we did this nightly for several months. And we were taking on average about 40 boxes and deliver them overnight to uh, UPS to have them delivered um, over to Tallahassee. But this, this hub that we launch is there to help you file for your unemployment or to assist with your unemployment. But more importantly, it's there to help you get connected to a job. And so again, that telephone number 305-929-1547. You call that number, you can either file for your employment or help you get connected to a job. We can provide the same services right over the phone that we would provide with you if you came into a career center. So this is a way for us to maintain our services to, uh, for this community, but more importantly, maintain the health and the distance to help our job seekers stay healthy, as well as the staff that we have in the career centers. So that's one piece. Because of the pandemic, and because we saw what happened with the unemployment system, we launched Operation Impact. And Operation Impact is a program that specifically helps, one, to get you connected to the unemployment system, second, for your job, also the training, but more importantly, for well, those individuals who are having difficulty um, with their house note, car note, um, uh, child care, utilities, we're gonna be there to be able to provide up to $1,000. We'll, we'll actually pay it on your behalf for those folks who are qualifying, apply right online. And so again, we launched that program to help those job seekers who we knew were having difficulties, were having some problems uh, getting their unemployment benefits. Matter of fact, I'll share with you that this program that we've launched, we sent the information up to the state, we sent it to the governor's office requesting for them to even launch a similar program so this way we can, it can happen statewide because we knew statewide individuals were having problems, particularly in the black community. And so we have this program, it's launched. But again, we look at it that if we don't have businesses um, operating, I cannot find folks a job. And so we're the only workforce board in the state of Florida, we're actually the only workforce board in the South that launched a layoff aversion fund. And that program we did in partnership. Well, let me back up for a second and say this. The first thing we did was to help stabilize or work with our chambers of commerce to help stabilize the access to information and resources by partnering with them through our layoff aversion activities. So we partnered with Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, um, the, the Beacon Council and Chemical. Now, we funded these four chambers here in Dade County to assist with helping small businesses be able to access uh, programs and loans through uh, Althea's uh, agency and others. That again, that program uh, is specifically to help fund staff in those chambers to be able to help them provide resources to uh, our communities. Now, I will tell you that uh, it was a way for us to help those chambers help their members, but more importantly, help those other businesses, particularly small businesses, to be able to stay afloat. And most folks in this community don't realize that 90% of the businesses in Miami-Dade County are small businesses. And when I define small, I'm referring to three up to no more than 25. We're talking about small businesses that are the backbone of our community. And if you want to talk about our, the backbone of the, of the Black community, it is small business. And so that's one initiative. But the, the most important initiative that we did launch was the, the layoff aversion fund. That program is to reimburse, it's a grant, it's not even a loan. And we partner with, again, Tools for Change, Chemical, uh, the Beacon Council, as well as the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. And so the role there was to have these organizations reach out and market, and they'll be able to give up to $10,000 uh, to reimburse those companies to, who had to repivot, reskill, retool, 
to maintain their employees, to keep them working. Again, something new. We've never done this before. Uh, we went through a series of discussions with the U.S. Department of Labor just to make sure that we were we had everything in a row. But again, that program is there. And we've put over close to $2 million uh, to be able to provide assistance uh, for small business. Again, it's not a loan, it is a grant. And so you can uh, file through Tools for Change with Leroy Jones, uh, Chemical with Joe Chi over at, uh, in their office, uh, Alec, uh, Alfred Sanchez over the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, or Mike Finney, with the Beacon Council. Those organizations are actually operating this program for us. And so it was a way for us to, again, maintain and help our businesses grow, uh, keep them, keep their employees working. But more importantly, it was a way for us to ensure that our job seekers had a place to go because of the pandemic. And so there's a number of initiatives that we've launched to keep people working. There's a number of apprenticeship programs I, I know our mayor spoke about that we have launched uh, with a number of companies uh, so that we can build a pipeline. So those who are looking for, again, employment, you can go call the number 305-929-1547 or go to our website, which is www.careersourcesfl.com. Again, it's Career Source, all spelled out in one word, S as in Sam, F as in Frank, L as in Larry, dot com. And they're going to get uh, access to a number of programs that we have. Uh, we have repivoted some of the programs that nominally you all know about, which is the Tech Hire program. Again, that program is designed for our youth to provide them access to technology. And in partnership with um, Steve Gallen, and, and we, we've launched that program. And actually, Steve was one of the uh, folks that gave us the idea uh, because we were funding the summer employment program. And uh, he felt we needed to have other programs to help uh, other youth in our community. And so this is, I think, it's been our fifth year but we had a chain. So all our programs were online and we had to make sure that all our kids had access, not only to technology, the laptops, but also access to, um, uh, to the internet. And so we partnered also with not only the school district, but also with Comcast. And Comcast awarded all the students who successfully completed the program uh, a year, uh, six months of internet access and a computer, we provided the other six months of access. So again, we're trying to ensure that our community is viable and being able to provide the services to help them and help grow our community. So again, I thank the, uh, the Black Affairs Advisory Board for putting this on. There's so many programs that we offer, I can go on and on, but I, I can tell you, we have committed staff, but we also have committed partners to make sure our community grows. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Beasley and Ms. Harris, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, if none of the other committee members on this panel have any questions actually uh, just for just for the record uh stanley campbell has his hand up and that's the only hand um and i did not see any questions online so after uh mr campbell's question uh i actually have two two follow-ups that i'll slip in here one for mr Be beasley which is mr beasley um do you do you need or can employers also reach out to career source if they need people even for temporary work yes i mean again i will share with uh, the folks here online and through, through um, facebook that uh you know our, again our shops are open but we've had employers who who are needing workers whether it's full-time or part-time uh we want employers to reach out to us we can offer what we call wage subsidies through on-the-job training, uh, paid worker experience. I can tell you there's a project right now that we are working with um, uh, with Leroy Jones over at Nana and Tools for Change of a project. They're trying to recruit uh, a number of students, a number, a number of people. So if you're looking for work, reach out to Leroy. But I think we're paying up to, I think it was, let me make sure I got my notes right because Leroy's going to kill me if I say too much money. Uh, but I think it's about the $20 uh, that we, uh, yeah, uh, about $20 an hour. <laughs> uh, but we need about 20 folks uh, to do uh, COVID outreach. But I can tell you that if employers need help finding workers, reach out to us. Uh, reach out to us. You can call 305. Not, and again, this is for employers. So let's get the numbers mixed up. Uh, but 305-929-1540. Again, 305-929-1540. Um, Robert Smith, 
uh, is the individual that you'll reach out to in terms of that uh, for, for employers. But if you're for job seekers, again, that telephone number, 305-929-1547. Uh, but again, Stephen, our, our doors are there to help employers. And again, it's perfect timing. So if they're leading workers, uh, again, we can subsidize the wages as they're working, or we can help recruit um, uh, individuals if they need uh, to get jobs filled as well. Perfect. And then this, the second quick question is for Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, if a small business has received a PPP loan, which has been forgiven, are they eligible to get another PPP loan? Thank you for that question, Stephen, and thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. I'm so grateful to the uh, Black Affairs Advisory uh, Board for letting us join. The great question, not only if you've had a PPP loan from 2020, can you get another one? You do not have to have forgiveness on that first loan to get the second loan. You do have to have spent all the money, though. So if you had a PPP loan in 2020, you spent it all and you need some more, you can, ideally you would go back to the same lender who already has your paperwork, but if they're not interested in doing another loan for you, you can go to any other lender you like uh, who's willing to make the loan to you. Please do not shop around. Please do not, meaning don't put in applications at more than one bank. Um, that's going to cause you problems on the back end with SBA. Um, but yes, absolutely. You can have uh, two PPP loans, one last year and one this year. Thank and you. I urge people to do that. And, and, and Mr. Rutledge, giving it back to you, I, there, there's only one hand raised, and that would be Stanley Campbell. Uh, hey, I, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, thank you. And um, um, I, what I failed in the last segment um, to reference that um, as a follow up here, we have, we have uh, partnered with the, the city of Miami and the mayor to provide um, upwards of 60,000 um, smart devices. And we anticipate hopefully um, with, 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 the, with the mayor of the county to do uh, upwards of 250 uh, thousand, uh, 250 um, um, smart devices, but we can actually take that up to a million devices. We have 12 million devices that we're doing uh, focused on, on the elderly population, those who, are, who, are, um, who receive um, home services. Uh, we have software online that is designed to track uh, vaccines. You, some of you may have seen that um, myvax.com. It's a free download. We don't charge anything for it. And the key there is that things that um, like food insecurities, um, where a provider can actually write a prescription so persons can get food with dignity as opposed to standing in line. Uh, the other part of those programs um, is that uh, you, through those, uh, a, a doctor can write a prescription for food and you can actually get your restaurants organized such that um, th they, the restaurant could get uh, 10,000 or so, you know, menus uh, as opposed to just uh, meals on wheels where the food folk shows up. So you're actually able to, to um, save your restaurants and as well have your population uh, get food with dignity. And what we've done is you've got a nutritionist who will actually certify three meals per restaurant. One of them has to be a special meal, generally low sodium. And in writing into the folks who are still on the line from the, the clinicians, those are called F codes. So um, the provider writes the F code, we can get them food, and then we would we expect to work with the city and the county as it relates to that. The, the key to those devices though, it is critical that we get smart devices. There, the, there's a thing called an FCC phone. Those are lockdown phone and devices, meaning you can get it for free, you can have very low internet, but, but the lockdown, you can't navigate the internet after the fourth. Really? Stanley, we are running up on time. So if you wanna if you wanna put your information out there that, that'll work. 
Yeah, myvax.com, and I'll, I'll, I'll partner uh, with any of the organizations um, that uh, are working toward this, um, this effort. Uh, we've, we've, we've got the partners are AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Samsung, and Apple. So, um, so I'm ready to work. And we love it. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Rutledge, uh, I see Mr. Thomas's hand, and then that's it. And I have one final question for Ms. Harris or Mr. Beasley. Um, do you uh, see any small businesses, minorities that might be reluctant because of loans, the term loan versus grant? And you said they could receive multiple loans. Uh, is there a limit to it because they're also uh, creating debt? Oh, thank you so much, Jen, because one of the things I neglected to mention, and you've allowed me now to mention, with the PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Loan, it is a 100% forgivable loan. So uh, assuming you do what you're supposed to with the money, it, it will never be a loan. And one of the wonderful things that came out of the Economic Aid Act uh, that was passed late last year is um, it made some changes to the PPP program from 2020 so that PPP monies are now considered not income to the business, so they're not taxed. And what you pay for with PPP money, you can still deduct on your tax return. So there's these, this great benefit. So the PPP, assuming you pay, use it the way you're supposed to, is a 100% forgivable loan. And so there will be no debt. And the only debt that you would carry uh, is if you get an SBA economic injury disaster loan, which carries a 30-year term. Maximum loan amount is $150,000. I'm told by people who are good at math, that means your loan is about five, six, seven hundred dollars a month, somewhere in that range, uh, for thirty years, albeit. But it's simple interest. It's not like student loan debt that climbs and climbs, or like your mortgage that grows and grows. This SBA loan uh, is excellent debt if you can get it. It's long-term debt for short-term needs. So it's a it's a really terrific loan product. PPP is even better because. If you don't use the funds appropriately, it converts into a five-year loan at 1%. So, you know, it's a totally, ideally manageable debt. So thank you so much for asking that question. I appreciate it. And Cliff, let me say um, with ours, ours again, the layoff aversion fund is a grant. And uh, again, you can access that through Tools for Change, the Beacon Council, a Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce and Chemical here in, in Dade County. I also would say that if you even re, if you're receiving other resources, other grants or loans, that is not an issue for our grant. That is not a basis. It doesn't disqualify you if you received uh, the PPP um, or through any other CARES Act dollars that were available. So again, ours is a grant, and there's no disqualifying item in terms of you cannot receive anything else. You that's not an issue. Or applying for our grant, okay. And two two final questions, seeing no other hands, and it's a yes or no to uh, uh, Ms. Harris and Mr. Beasley. Uh, do you see a disparity in black businesses and or uh, black folks taking advantage of the things you've talked to us about today? I'm gonna go with not yet. Okay. No, I don't not no, I don't see a disparity. I mean, the programs are open and available to all uh, who are eligible and who can produce the documentation needed for these loans. That's the challenge. But uh, they're open and available to all. Okay, Mr. Beasley. And I would have to say the same. Uh, we, you know, with intent was to ensure that we work with organizations that we knew uh, that could get out. Uh, I know a number of you all, a number of folks called me and say, why didn't you allow Miami-Dade uh, Chamber of Commerce? And again, that's why I preference first to say, we did contract with Miami-Dade uh, Chamber of Commerce but to do a late to, to assist uh, with resources. But we went with Tool for Change for those businesses that typically would not join a Chamber of Commerce. That's where I was trying to touch base with. 
And I knew in our community, the organization that could do it would be tools for change. And so that's why we partnered with them to ensure we did it strategically so that we knew that we could touch every aspect. So with chemical, we knew that small Hispanic chain, uh, businesses would go to them and not the Greater Miami Chamber or the Beacon Council. It's with intent. So I, you know, we will take a look at to see if there was any disparities. But again, like with Althea, every, you, you must, your paperwork must be in order for us to approve it. Must be in order. So with that. All right, and then Dr. Hardwick, the the last question was for you. Does Florida Memorial ha one? I assume that enrollment for for the next semester, uh, you you're seeking enrollment, and two, are there any programs or or things that people can do during this downtime to advance their uh, their education since COVID has has disrupted so much of our lives. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for, for that question. Let, let me just say, it, it, even in times like this, uh, people have a tendency to lose focus on, on staying focused uh, uh, around education. I, I, I want to I wanna encourage any of the listeners that it's so important to stay focused and moving forward and, and not, not drop out of school. Uh, oftentimes, uh, African Americans, we, we have a tendency when, when it gets a little tough, we stop, we stop attending school. This is not the time to do so. It, it's so important that we remain focused and remain steadfast because there we provide assistance to students. Uh, now, sometimes we have individuals come looking for us to pay the full tuition and that's just not that's just not reasonable but we do everything possible to make sure that we help our students remain in school and and not stop out because if we keep that kind of mindset Stephen we're going to continue to broaden the gaps in in in, in uh, uh, educational attainment um, so I want to encourage I wanna encourage our students, I wanna encourage the parents and others, please make sure your sons and your daughters remain in school because it's so important to realize that, listen, uh, the, 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 the jobs of right now will not be the jobs of tomorrow. And you're going to need a quality education that will help you to be competitive in a global marketplace. So I'll put a period on that part. The, this, one of the other initiatives that, that re recently I launched uh, in partnership and as a result of the support funding support from the Miami Dolphins and Lennar Foundation is a, is a certificate in construction trades. It, this is a 12 week program, uh, 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 free, free tuition. All it requires is you to just be able to commit the time to attend you will get certified in OSHA. You can get the, you will be taught uh, in the areas of HVAC, plumbing and electrical. We pay for the entire tuition. We pay for transportation. We will pay for food for you to attend. This program is designed, and this is a program I started at FIU in 2018. And this program is doing phenomenal, phenomenal and I'm bringing it to FIU, I mean, Florida Memorial. And this program, even when I designed it back then, Lenar gave me a million dollars to start it, mind you. Um, and they just recently gave me uh, $600,000. $600, it, really, it really is in, it, it's uh, over 700,000 actually, uh, that they've given me for this program. And it was designed for high school dropouts or individuals who, completed high school, but did not want to go to college, uh, returning citizens or women who are looking uh, for opportunities for veterans or individuals who just wanted to want to reinvent themselves. And you're talking about in the construction industry, uh, it's a high demand all across the country. There is significant talent gaps. And when you talk about the average salary coming out in, in that particular industry, somewhere around 50,000 a year, that's significant. 
And most importantly, not only do I want you to be able to acquire the skills that are going to help create economic opportunities for you and your families, but I want individuals who complete this program to learn how to create your own businesses uh, because that is so critical. And I can tell you the program that I started at FIU, that program is now producing literally over a hundred and some odd graduates. And we've had many uh, African-American females who have already gone on and to create their own businesses. And we're doing that at Florida Memorial. So it's a free program. All they have to do is literally go to um, www uh fmuniv.edu and access the program it's no cost free of charge that sounds good mr rutledge no other questions sir what was that website again dr hardrick <laughs> www.fmuniv.edu thank you you're welcome we, we have to connect on that and okay, get businesses them. created I'll turn it back over to you if there are any more questions or any more comments from our panelists for this. Well, actually, pastor Barber has one. And then I promise, because he's a pastor, he gets to go. <laughs> I said, no, this, no, this, thank you so much, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Relish. Listen, I was just going to say that we've been, uh, we were uh, privy to receive a wealth of information and it was being um, shared in real time. So some of us write fast, some of our. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that well. I was just going to recommend that uh, if those panelists that were sharing information, if somehow they could channel um, that information over, um, you know, um, to maybe uh, Taritha, and then as well as for those that have some of the information that's uh, perhaps uh, social media ready, um, that you know, because it's a wealth of information, and we want to help. Um, you're talking about the state of Black uh, Miami you know, on, on our various platforms, if we can share this information, um, Dr. Hodrick, you know, Althea has shared, you know, uh, uh, Rick has shared, you know, there's a lot of information that's been shared. So we have uh, information that could be uh, sh uh, funneled over to Retha. And perhaps if you have some, um, some social media graphics um, that we could help to put on our various platforms to get the word out. Because a lot of times the reason why people don't take advantage is because it just, fail to have the knowledge of these resources that are available. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very so, much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Pastor Barber, uh, what, what do you guys want us to send the information? Because I'll be more than happy to, to do so. So I'll, I actually, let me say this, for, for those of you, all of you will receive follow-ups and then you, we can we can work from there. I know I've reached out to to most of you personally. I can also say that to the extent that you've given email addresses and phone numbers, those are also in our comments right now live. I mean, not email addresses, but websites are in our comments on the Facebook Live. But yes, uh, Pastor Barb is 100% correct, and we do need to collect and distribute all of this information in one place. So you can respond to my email, you can respond to Aretha's email, you can respond to uh, any other member of the Black Affairs Advisory Board, and, and we, we will get this uh, distributed. And I know I tweeted at you, so you can feel free to tweet back at me, sir. So there you go. I, I, I'm a big believer in social media. Um, so Mr. Rutledge, I think that's it. I, we don't have any other questions. Mr. Chair, if there's no more questions, I'll hand the baton back over to you. Uh, I appreciate that. And let me say this, the, the very first year that, that we did this, it was scheduled for three hours and we ran four and a half. We, this one, was scheduled for two hours and we went over by 42 minutes. I want to first apologize to everyone, including the public that we went over um, and our panelists, many of whom who have been waited patiently and who have uh, uh, been with us from start to finish. I, I'd also note that if, if we're, we're noting firsts, this is the first time that, that we, we 
have, have had the benefit of Commissioner Monestein being here from start to finish. I know he, he would peek in and then business would call when we did it during the day. So we that we certainly appreciate Commissioner Monestein bearing with us uh, the whole time as well. Um, in closing, because I don't really have much to say, you've heard a lot. We've gotten a lot of great information um, we've heard some troubling statistics as well. I don't know that anybody's satisfied with the answers on what we're going to do about vaccinating and closing the disparities there, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. Um, however, what's the next step? We as the Black Affairs Advisory Board will prepare a report to the Board of County Commissioners uh, with recommendations addressing, one, closing the disparity in vaccinations the institutional disparity that exists, and as importantly, our community's own concerns about the efficacy and what taking the vaccine means. So we need to close both of those and we need to give suggestions to the county commission about how to accomplish that. Uh, secondly, there is clearly a disparity, we've heard it uh, from our, our two esteemed educators uh, you've got 20% reduced enrollment at Florida Memorial. I, I would imagine that FIU, UM, and all the other schools are, are seeing the same. Um, you're also, you, you also, Dr. Gallen spoke uh, passionately about the, the challenges that the work from home or work for, or excuse me, school from home, uh, in-person school from home hybrid is presenting, particularly for for uh, our black children, and we we need to to closely coordinate with his office and the uh, the Miami Dade School Board on what we can do to to close that that disparity as well. Finally, even though neither one of our panelists will, will, it, will know it's there yet because it's their job to make sure it doesn't exist and I appreciate and love them for it, we need to monitor whether or not there is a disparity in the SBA, PPP loans, as well as if there's ways that we can get information out about the things that Career Source are doing so that we can make sure that our community, which is, is oftentimes the forgotten community, um, takes advantage of every tool. And we've heard a lot of tools that, that are in the toolbox, takes advantage of every single tool. So in, in our eyes, I don't think the disparity is addressed unless and until people are amazed that there's a greater percentage of, of, of Black participants in all things. Like that should be our job and our goal. Um, so from there, that will be the nature of, the, of, of our report and our work in the coming meetings. All of our meetings are public meetings. The public are, are, are welcome to, to come and attend. Um, I'm sure all of our panelists will hear from us again because I'm sure we're gonna have meetings, questions that come up in the meetings as we prepare this report. Um, finally, to, to close it out, I wanna thank each and every member of the Miami Day Black Affairs Advisory Board for, for attending, for, for being involved. Um, it, it was a long night and none of us get paid. And I think that's, that's uh, important to note. And of course, in conclusion, last but not least, the most important person that helps the, the board do its work, I wanna thank Ms. Retha Boone Fai, who has worked tirelessly and endlessly in bringing this virtual State of Black Miami to, uh, to fruition. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to wish everyone else good night. Mr. DeAndre Slater, Ms. Grizel Marino, thank you for, for all of your technical and back end help. No one got to see you, but we knew you were there and we appreciate it. Um, Rita, you need to tell me if I forgot anybody or, or, or are we okay to go to bed now? Uh, we're, are we, we can't, but I just need to let everybody know that remember, we have Black History Month. The calendar is on our website as well as the unveiling. We'll be unveiling our Black History Month um, photo exhibit in the Stephen P. Clark on this coming Monday at 8, I'm sorry, at 11.30 a.m. So that would be Monday, February 8th, 11.30 a.m. There's the poster. Um, and also 
just want to make absolutely sure that um, everyone is on board. It will be socially distant, so just make sure you get to the uh, event. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of our uh, panelists, and I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thanks so much.